Hi and welcome to a very special edition of the Leadership Untitled podcast, presented by myself and also the founder of the L&D Mastermind, James Hudson. In this special episode, myself and James lead a panel of guests around the subject of L&D value. How do we move away from being order takers in an organisation to become wave makers? And what's more, it's your questions that we're asking them. So much advice, guidance, experience and expertise comes through this episode to help you guys start taking those first steps and overcoming some of those barriers that lie along the way to move towards that bigger value that we can have and also avoid those cyclical redundancy cycles that always seems to hit us. What value can we have and how can we have it? How can that lead into leadership and coaching interventions that really do support a performance culture and add value? So please join me in welcoming Charles Jennings, David James, Satnam Sagu and Joe Wright to the Leadership Untitled podcast. So today's event, Order Takers to Wave Makers. I'm going to do some more formal introductions later on, but we've got a great panel on there. Uh, Satnam Sagu, David James, Joe Wright, Charles Jennings, all looking from slightly different angles about how we as L&D teams can actually have a, a bigger impact on the organisation. Now, I think one thing that's really important for me to make clear at this moment, and I'll make clear as we go through the day, is nobody actually thinks we're deliberately turning up and not adding value to an organisation. Every L&D team that I have been part of have always been really busy, been doing great work with great intent, and actually the results of what they were doing was fantastic. Yeah. However, what is also true is that there is this restructure and recycle, uh, the redundancy cycle that team seems to come through. If I just kind of kick off there and just kind of show you what I mean by that, is that in a recent poll that I did on um, LinkedIn – we can see that most L&D professionals experience that cycle every one to two years. So there's something at play here to kind of go, okay, we are adding value. We are working hard. We are experts in what we do. But at the same time, that value for some reason or whatever reason isn't translating to the decision table when times get difficult. So why might that be? And you can see there at the kind of the bottom of the page that that is a kind of a snapshot of my 20, just over 20 years in L&D, uh, restructure, redundancy, redundancy, restructure, restructure. So kind of 10 restructures that are directly involved the teams I've been a part of, five times promotions from it and five times redundancies from it. And it does get you to that point. And most L&D professionals have been at this point at some stage where they've gone, why should I bother? Why should I bother? And I think it's, what's really interesting is when you start looking at other industries, and, and I've got a slide up there that's, that's just about Tottenham Hotspur, and I think, you know, me and James joked the other day we could probably swap it to Manchester United. <laughs> really, would be you know me, I love relevant. a football conversation, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> but what's really interesting about this piece for me is that when results, and I'll think about performance and results, when performance and results on the pitch are not good, all attention tends to go to the manager. It's always the football manager that comes under that scrutiny. They're not good enough. Sack the manager, get another manager in. And that is why there is a managerial merry-go-round in football that is just ridiculous. And then after a few managers, if it's still going wrong, people start looking at the owners. Are the owners running the club right? Are they choosing the right managers? And then after a couple of cycles of that, we start looking at the players and going, hang on a minute, is it the players that keep getting these managers sat? Are they putting the effort in that they should be doing? It's only at the end of that that see the coaches and the trainers of those players the behind the scenes actually start coming under some sort of scrutiny. And I think that's a really important point to sort of reflect on for a moment. Every single one of us in the roles and organisations and departments that we're in, why is it that the coaches and the trainers within those football teams don't come under immediate scrutiny when performance and results aren't as they should be? I'm just going to give you a moment, just 10, 20 seconds or so, just to silence, just to have a think about that yourself. Why is that?
Now, for me, the obvious answer in this equation is that there is a, a very clear and explicit way in which we see the work that those trainers and coaches do with the players and how that translates to what happens on the pitch. It is clear and obvious the way that they work with those players, whether that's on fitness, whether that's on passing, whether that's on possession, whatever it might be, it's clear how that impacts players on the pitch. Also, however, those coaches and those trainers are carrying out their sessions based on a vision and a mission that is set out by the owner and the manager. They're not trying to create their own vision for the way that the team should play. They have their own vision and mission around training and diet and all those great things that they're going to be doing with those guys. But they very much carry out the vision of the operational leadership teams. And I think this is really important when we look at that in terms of our own functions, our own learning and coaching functions within organisations and say, is that the case? Why is it that we're often the first ones to be let go, but the same managers and the same owners and the same players, if you like, are constantly in place making the same mistakes? Now, ordinarily, what I find myself doing or I've found myself doing over the years is just sitting back and hoping things will change. Let's just hope that when I go to this new job or this new team or we've had this restructure, let's just hope it pans out differently. Let's hope the stakeholders think differently. Let's hope the head of HR and the senior leaders, they give us a chance to do this differently. They let us do. Let's hope we don't rely on e-learning as much or whatever it might be. And this is where one of my favourite films kick in, The Shawshank Redemption. Turn Mine away too. now if you've never <laughs> seen it. <laughs> <laughs> um, because hope plays a vital role through this film. However, what's really interesting is there's two very different perspectives on what hope actually is or the impact of it. So we can see Andy Dufresne on the left-hand side from Shawshank Redemption, and we've got Red, his good mate that he meets inside there or becomes good mates with. Now, Red's view on hope, who's been in prison for many decades, is hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. Now, again, I'll certainly put my hand up and say at some points in L my L&D career, I have felt like I've been driven insane by the way that we're working and by the things that I want to do and the reasons why we can't do it. But equally, on the opposite side of the coin, Andy said hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. And I think there's an interesting interesting uh, debate there to be had about what we should be doing. Yes, there should be hope in that we can do this differently. But if all we're doing is sitting down and hoping and not actively going after this and experimenting and trying things to make this happen, then guess what? Very little is going to happen. And over the last two or three years, what's, what's really, really been interesting is that people have become more and more important than they've ever been in business. You know, things that we said we'd never be able to do, like let people work from home and trust them to work from home and give them the flexibility to work. I mean, I used to work at places like Sky and Talk Talk, and the idea of first line agents being able to work from home, taking customer calls, it would just never happen. It would never, it was never entertained. But now it's what we do. But the well being of our people has never been more important. The mental health of our people has never been more important. Diversity and inclusion. Is it an all-time high when it comes to actually companies trying to invest in this type of stuff? However, at the same time, over those two or three years, people functions were still being let go. Now, again, what can we think and what can we make of that? My reflection on this, when I decided whether to just give up in L&D or go after it, was there's no smoke without fire. Why is this? Why are we being let go when we are people experts? And these are the conclusions I came up with, that there are regular traps that L&D teams, and you know what? As I said at the start of this, uh, this talk, that I as well have fallen into, and the teams I've been part of, the teams I have led have been part of, 
we are falling into these traps for various reasons. The first one is training, order taking. We focus on training out messages all the time, which 90% of the time might even just be posh communication channels. <laughs> If all we do is training, we're not actually considering or influencing how that translates into performance at the end of the day. What do people actually need? We're basically serving up a dish, letting them eat it, and then washing the dishes and forgetting about it. Results. What do we measure? Now, I'm not one of those people that says we shouldn't measure how many courses are on the LMS or we shouldn't measure how happy people are after a session and how confident they are. I think these are important guidelines and measures for ourselves. However, as I'm sure we'll talk about during the day, the CEO probably doesn't care about any of them. So what do they care about? What are the actual business metrics that are important to them? And how does our work contribute directly or indirectly to them that's what we need to be focusing on analysis we love a good analysis whether it's a training needs analysis or a learning needs analysis or a good survey whatever it might be now here's the trap that we fall into if you ask people what training they want they are restricted into telling you what training they want mm -hmm. <laughs> sounds simple but they are well, if you ask me what training I want, I want I want CIPD. I'd love to be trained on this system. I want this, that, and the other, whatever it might be. It's uh, Sorry to cut across you, Rob, but it's the old famous Henry Ford one, isn't it? If I asked my customers what they wanted, they'd say, a faster horse, please. Um, exactly so, that. Yeah. Exactly that. And learning is the same. You know, you are doing a learning needs analysis. What would you like to learn? Well, you know, show me the menu and I'll choose from it. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you start asking things like, okay, Give me a score out of 10 in terms of how much you trust your manager. Now, that's a question I'm sure the CEO would be interested in seeing the answers to. Mm. Give me an example of one thing your leader could do to help your performance improve. Give me three examples of things that are currently blocking your performance and stopping you doing the best you can do every day. And the answers to these things might not be things or solutions that L&D can put in place but it shows a real link to what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Prioritization. I love this one because it's my dad is bigger than your dad. How often do we choose what we work on based on who shouts the loudest, what the head of HR tells us to do, or the CEO comes in and says, let's work on that one because that's the order of the day. In the meanwhile, fires are burning everywhere. Inductions are out of date. No one can use systems, but the head of sales wanted that. So it's all good. We need to think of a better way to doing it. And here's the, and here's the challenge I would set to everyone in L&D is really consider and challenge back on whose priorities these actually are. Because if it is the HR director or the CEO, or whoever else it might be, they are the owners of all these priorities. The inductions are not ours. We write inductions because they're requested and needed by those heads of to train up their new people. So what's more important for them at that moment? Is it this new thing or is it this induction or is there another way we can actually start looking at these things? And then the last one is symptoms. Too often we focus on the symptoms of a problem. And again, that's not necessarily our fault. That's what comes to us because our stakeholders are focusing on the symptoms of a problem. For example, these agents aren't following the process when it comes to complaints correctly. So we need to train them on complaints again. And guess what happens in six months time? We'll retrain them because they're still not doing it right. What's the real problem there? How can we talk to our stakeholders to find out what's really going on? Back to our friends in prison in Shawshank. And I think it's really interesting that Red said this at one point, sitting there after being turned down from parole a fair few times. And he took, looked at the walls going around the yard and he said, these walls are funny. First, you hate them, then you get used to them, and enough time passes and you get to depend on them. That's institutionalized. Now, I want you to sort of where you are today, just visualize yourself staring at those walls for a second. And I want you to replace the word walls with LMS systems. The funny these LMSs, when we first have them, we hate them. Yeah, quite often we hate them. 
<laughs> then you get used to them. Yeah, they're all right. Enough time passes, we depend on them. Thank God we've got the LMS to roll this piece of e-learning out to 8,000 people now so they can all spend three hours off their primary jobs and complete it. Now, there may be many other words you can you can swap into there. Choose your own. Add your own. You know, whether it's e-learnings, inductions, accreditations, team meetings, these things that we hate when they come along, and then we get used to them, and then for some reason we depend on them, and we can't break those habits. So what do we need to do to start to try and break those habits? One of the things I think we're going to talk about today is performance. And I want you to just write down next to you at this moment, how you define performance. How would you define it? How would you measure it? Think if you were to ask your stakeholders and your senior leaders, how do you know that someone has performed? How do you know that that team has performed? Write down your definitions to that. Well, what's interesting is it, it tends to be that we start tying it into the results. It tends to be very difficult to define without saying a target, a result has been reached, a metric has been hit, whatever it might be. So here's a question I want you to think about during the course of today. And that is, is it possible to perform and not get the result? Is it possible to perform and not get the result? And when we start thinking of it in that way, we can start to separate the two and say, okay, how do I focus on improving performance without it being shackled by the results all the time? How can I define it so if it builds, it will naturally impact the results rather than being defined by it? And that is both L&D's performance and the performance of the organization. And when it comes to perform, I've put together a, a simple list of little tips. And again, all of these we'll be digging into more today about how we can start looking at. And it might be that at the end of the day, when James comes back on uh, just after 12 o'clock and starts talking about what you're going to do differently from today, you pick one of these based on the advice and the tips that the panel look at. So training consultancy. Instead of training consultancy, let's start moving towards performance consultancy. Instead of consulting with our stakeholders on what training we can do for them, how can we help them with the performance of their teams? How does that tie into the performance of the business? How can we measure our performance to help them with that? Instead of supporting managers do their job, how do we enable leaders? How do we enable those leaders to develop their teams and their people? How do we enable those leaders to have great conversations that unlock the potential of their teams? Instead of focusing purely on our productivity and thinking everyone will be interested in that, how do we tie that in and align it to results of the business? Instead of focusing purely on a learning culture and getting people learning, how do we go about fostering a coaching culture? where great conversations are happening all the time and leaders are taking ownership of those conversations with their people and genuinely listening to them and building trust. A key one about learning culture for me is that, guess what? You've already got one. People are always learning. If you're in L&D and you know there's a team in your business that are full of bad habits, guess what? They learned them from somewhere. Whether it was from each other, whether it was from the system, whether it was from the manager, it's all learned. So how can we start to guide that through a coaching culture? When it comes to those priorities, instead of who shouts the loudest, how do we start to order those? What's important for the business and how can we help them decide which ones they want us to work on first? Instead of the first option always being courses, how can we either design and create resources or encourage others to create resources that people need at the point they need them. And the last one, instead of always thinking skill set first, how do we start moving towards influencing people mindset first? And by that, I mean a simple example. 
let's look at coaching, leaders coaching. If I train leaders how to coach, and I'm sure many L&D professionals and teams on there have done that in the past, how often does that lead to those leaders and still not having those coaching conversations with their teams? And then we start to question their mindset down the line as to why they're not doing it when they've been showed how to do it. They've actually been given a tool set of things to actually go away and do it, but they're still not. Well, if we can actually start to think about how we influence the mindset of people, how do we actually start getting people to believe and co-create that culture with us where they seem, for example, coaching is integral to achieving that performance in that organization. And with that mindset, the skill set will be so much easier to learn and embed. So back to our friends in the prison. I guess it comes down to a simple choice, as Andy said. Get busy living or get busy dying. It's time for a commitment. We either just leave l and and go and do something on our own and just say it's not worth the fight, or we make a commitment today on the back of today's session to actually say, yeah, this is worth it. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. But remember, it took Andy a while, and I'm not going to try, I'm going to try my best not to spoil the film for those that have not seen it. <laughs> it took a while for Andy to come up with the solution he was looking for. Uh, 30 odd years or 20 odd years, I believe, was the, uh, it was the actual time. So it doesn't happen overnight. So I'll be encouraging at the end of this session to go, what's the one thing you can start with? What's the first step to take? What's the first experiment you can run to really start pushing it this way? And there you go. What's your plan? What's your plan? And I would add again, without trying to give away too much about the film, he had to encounter some very, very difficult and challenging and hardships in order to get through to where he eventually wanted to be. But he succeeded and did it. He did and the same. I think the same is, is in L&D. You know, this is not something that's going to change overnight but it's going to involve a lot of difficult, uh, challenging conversations perhaps with some stakeholders to re-educate. Um, mm. But it is worth the challenge and the difficulty uh, to get through to the other side. Absolutely. I think, you know, a key point what you've made there, James, is the people. The people mm. in the in authority, the people at the top, they were blockers for some of the good things that, that were trying to be done in this film, in the prison. Mm. How do we influence that? How do we try and make an agenda where people can buy into that? Yeah. So, yeah. our event, mm. our guests, our panel, and what we're going to be doing today. All so excited anyone, and waiting to, to join us. They're all chomping at the bit, waiting yeah. to come on. <laughs> um, so, uh, I've, uh, I feel a bit weird introducing myself first, um, but um, <laughs> we're part of the panel, aren't we, James? We're here. <laughs> yeah. So, the, who we've got today, I'm not going to read all this stuff out because I've done some lives around this. You probably know quite a few of these people as you're involved in L&D, but we can start to see what I've called the superpowers of each of us are here today. So please, please, please take advantage of this time to ask us any questions. Uh, and I've got some questions to get us started as well that people have sent through prior. So for me, my focus is around coaching conversations. How do we utilize those to get messages spreading and people developed and trust built, but also how do we encourage leaders to lead with vision first rather than it always being about results first. And I think this is an important lesson, not just for those leaders that we talk about external to us. We are all leaders of L&D as well. Whether you've got it in your title or not, you are an L&D leader because you are a role model for it in that organization. So how do we lead with our vision and connect it to the company vision? We've all got my uh, my pal James here as well. Um, so James is a kind of key uh, way of thinking around these things is around community and compassionate leadership, which you'll talk about a little bit more later on. Mm. Community is no surprise because that's what the L&D community is, the L&D mastermind community. But compassionate leadership, why is that important? Caring about our people, having great conversations with our people, why is that important to actually get performance moving in the right way but more importantly why is it important for lnd i was going to say rob don't get me started on compassionate leadership i, I could spend the entire day talking on that alone <laughs> well we we'll, we'll probably will do <laughs> <laughs> 
We've also got Satnam Sagu joining us. Um, I'm really excited about Satnam coming along. Um, she is the Associate Chief People Officer at Imperial College Healthcare and formerly uh, Director of Learning at the British Red Cross. And what is always vital, I feel, on these types of events is having someone who has really walked that front line. So worked in these environments, had these challenges and still having these challenges today, but also particularly with Satnam in some organizations where, you know what, the priority really isn't about a training course or a piece of e-learning. Priorities of the NHS and the British Red Cross are very profound and powerful. So how do we actually get about doing the things we need to do in an L&D perspective to contribute towards those things and not taking people away from the vital work that they're doing? Can't wait for, for Satnam to talk about that. Fab. Uh, David, we've got David James on today. Now, David, you'll probably all know uh, most from the, the host of the Learn Development podcast. Um, he's also the CLO of Loop. Superpower wise, learning in the flow of work. This is something that, that James talks about a lot. How do we actually stop this motion that we tend to have of putting a fork in the road, taking people away from their jobs to a learning event and then putting them back and hoping it'll all just land how can we give them what they need when they need it at that point of need fab rob should we bring these guests on the screen as you're introducing them yeah go for it fab so let me just bring satnam into the room although that was the wrong time to turn her camera on as she was just taking a <laughs> swig of a cup of tea good morning satnam great to have you here with us today Morning. Uh, it's quite a big mug as well. Look, it just covers my whole face. Yeah, in opportunity right there. That's the <laughs> Fab, and we've got David. Let's bring you in, David. Morning, David. Hi there, James. Hi, Rob. Hi, David. Good to see you. Hey, David. Fabulous. And we've and got then. Joe. We've got Joe. We know she's there because she's she came on early this morning to test everything was working with us. Morning. There we go. Morning, De morning, Joe. How are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Now, I think what's really important about Joe, forget the fact that she is CEO of Coaching Culture. It's that last piece around being a model for the LPI calendar next year. And if you've not, and if you're not seen, please hunt down her profile to see evidence of said photo shoot. <laughs> it's going to be big. <laughs> Thanks for that, Rob. Thank you. Anytime, of anytime. all the things I, I might be known for, that's it. Princess Leia of Star Wars is the new me. This time next year, <laughs> that's what you'll be known for. <laughs> <laughs> but coaching conversations and building trust. You know, with, with Joe, trust is the most important thing in an organization. How do we build relationships? How do we build that trust and stop viewing it as this paper thin thing that we mustn't break? How do we start building it up and making it more resilient? And then, uh, last but certainly not least, is Charles Jennings. If we bring him on. There we go. Hi, Charles. Uh, good morning, everybody. So, 70 2010 fame, Charles. Um, and I guess, you know, what's really important here about Charles is that this isn't just about how we go about theoretically putting great learning into, into place and start translating that into performance. 70 2010 is a framework by which we actually start looking at the elements that are required to do that successfully. Um, and I think part of today will be, you know, sometimes it's not even about the numbers. It's about the process, the roles, the people that are going to be involved and the challenges within. So there we have it. That's our panel. Fabulous. Thank you to all of our panellists for joining us today. Uh, we really, really appreciate you, uh, you joining us and being part of our guest expert panel. Now, on my screen, my screen has gone completely black, but I hope you guys can see me. Uh, the joys of technology, eh? <laughs> That's it. Um, I'm hoping that maybe when we remove the slides from the screen, fabulous. Nope, I still can't see myself, but hey, I'll just be the voice in the background. There you go. <laughs> Back at Technology. Time, Brilliant. No, nope. so long as you can see everyone, Rob, uh, and, uh, and, and yeah, I don't know why that's happened, but hey, the joys of technology, everyone. Um, so brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us to our panel. Um, and, and just a reminder to everyone who is live with us right now, put your, put your uh, comments out there, anything in the chat box. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on Facebook, on LinkedIn. So any questions that you have for our panel, please feel free to send those in 
uh, and we will ask our panel your questions. This is a live event, so join us and interact with us as we go. Um, but back over to you, Rob. Cool. Well, I'm going to get the ball rolling and um, I'm going to choose the first victim. Everyone's sitting there now going, is it going to be me? What's he going to say? Um, and I'm going to go straight to David. Hi, David. Hi, Rob. So the question I've got for you is, is it time to rename L&D to performance and development? And would that make any difference? Um, look, I've, I'll put my cards on the table. I think, I think that, uh, that learning is a massive misnomer here. And I think that uh, there, there are plenty of people who've never worked in learning and development who think that our job is learning and it's not. Um, I think that from the conversations, the meaningful conversations I've ever had uh, in uh, any of the organisations I've worked in doing learning and development, uh, those leaders and stakeholders who really wanted to see change didn't talk to me about learning. They talked to me about helping prepare people to do something differently. So it was about doing. Now, what you mentioned earlier about uh, performance, you had your definition of, uh, of performance. And I, I make a distinction between performance and results. Performance for me is how people do the work. And you could do enough of the right stuff without getting meaningful results every single day. But, but, but by doing enough of the right stuff, you are recognized by your organization for doing that. Uh, and then you will get results at some time. I, I, I certainly, in my, my last couple of years at Disney, I found that, uh, that, that on a day-to-day -day basis, I was taking two steps forward, one step back. And sometimes I was taking in one step forward and two steps back. And it was just the nature of the job. But you find that mm. but by doing enough of the right stuff, then it is recognized. So I, I do believe that performance um, should replace learning in, in the title. Uh, and I, th I think we should confine learning to the bin because I just think that we're lost in it. And I think that people spend far too much time figuring out how to make uh, uh, theoretically robust learning solutions that just do not work in the wild. They don't yeah. work where people are, uh, are expected to perform uh, and perform differently or perform better. And I think that if we focus much more on uh, the way work is done um, with an eye on the results and the desired outcomes, I think we'd be in a better position. And I think that we might even be in a position where we could demonstrate some return on value, let alone some, uh, some efficacy. I think it's really, I think it's really interesting. I, I had a conversation with someone yesterday, what someone who was uh, one of my coaching clients, and they were actually designing a, a course for some leaders, and um, they had all this content that they were looking and juggling around to try and put into the course. and And they mentioned one of the things, and I'm going to look at all the eyes of everyone on the panel now when I say this: um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> yeah, there's a few little giggles. As if, oh no, not, not that one. Rolls of eyes. David shaking the head. And I'm like. This is the theory stuff. And I don't, don't get me wrong. I understand why as an L&D professional, you might want to explore that theory and start to consider it in your own work. But I'm yet to find a, a really valid reason to put it into a course. And I, the example I used was that if I'm going to go for surgery, I don't need the surgeon to explain all the theory behind all the things they've learned so they can give me benefit from that procedure I'm going through and actually help me go about my day. I just want them to use all that experience that they've got to help me do what I need to do. So how do we start pulling that back? Um, so I think it's quite interesting because I think it was on our the, the podcast episode uh, that I did with yourself, David, or it might have been with Nick Shackleton-Jones or both, that we talk about why do we even call them learners? Mm. They're not learners, they're, they're people. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really good point. So if I, if I come to Joe... Yeah. And Joe, I bet you know what I'm going to ask you now. No, I don't. <laughs> I'm waiting on tenter hooks here, Rob. So in terms of, because we mentioned learning there then, mm -hmm. and I know that speaking of yourself and, and, and Adam Carr as well, the kind of business partner and mm -hmm. joint brain behind coaching culture. Um, we've talked a lot about the difference between a learning culture and a yeah. coaching culture. Mm -hmm. What is the difference? What, should, why should we care about it? Should we do both? What, what's your thoughts on it? So obviously I talk a lot more about a coaching culture and, you know, I'm really happy to share our definition, which is, um, and it's already been touched on in your introduction, uh, although I was anxious to know what the F was when you were going for a from and a to learning culture. I'm thinking, what is this F? What could it be? And it's it changed saying, various occasions. <laughs> I like the coaching culture in there. So our definition is a coaching culture is a place where 
Authentic leaders and managers help people to grow, thrive and perform through effective conversations, honest feedback underpinned by trust. So that's exactly to David's point there, all about how you go about doing the job, how you enable others to, to be the best they can be. That's a coaching culture. And don't get me wrong, in terms of a learning culture, oh, I've not exactly found the perfect definition of what that is, apart from uh, organisations are encouraging learning to happen, but through training courses, um, expecting people to change on, on the back of going on a day's course and saying these are the values that we will adopt in the, the business. And I think fundamentally it's about a coaching culture focusing on mindset and behaviours, the how, and a learning culture being a little bit more on the skills and the knowledge. And, and to your point earlier, Rob, the skills bit can often be the easier bit. It's the mindset that, you know, changing people's mindset to change their behaviours every day is where I believe the magic will happen. And how how's best to do that? Because I know there'll be lots of people kind of probably screaming at the screens now and kind of going that, you know, I've tried this. I've tried to go to my boss and tell them that we need to think differently about this. And I've been told to get back in my box and, and carry on doing what I've done all the time. I think it is about showing the difference when you when, you know, I have a, I've got a little phrase. That I say when your mindset changes, everything becomes possible. Wind that wind that up on an organizational level and it is so powerful you know that's where it is about an organizational growth mindset and that by default is where people are wanting to learn willing to learn becoming the best version of themselves all the great things that we say but it's about creating that environment to help people to flourish and it is about you exactly what you said before enabling others to become leaders help them develop their teams and so it is about showing the results that come on the back of building trust because when you build trust performance will follow mm -hmm. absolutely uh, charles if we kind of like look at that then look at that as a whole process so 70 20 10 has, has been around a while and, and and quite often i find myself having to talk to people around just forget the numbers yeah. Um, because people tend to just want to argue about the numbers rather than do any work to actually implement <laughs> the way of doing it. Um, but roughly speaking, and again, I, 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 with you, I feel pressure in getting this right now. I should just let you explain. <laughs> but the 10%, the, the obviously, the 10% is around the formal stuff. So the formal stuff that L&D teams are notoriously good at providing. So whether that's courses, whether that's videos, going and reading a book about it, and e-learning, all those sort of things. The 20% is more about that socialization of that learning. So whether that's uh, forums, comparing, comparing mistakes, coaching, networking, mentoring, all those great things that we can learn from each other as we're doing today. And then the 70, the big part of it is learning through doing, just learning through doing the job. And I think what I love about what, what 702010 represents as well is then switching back, flipping that classroom and saying, OK, let's go and talk about this in the classroom. What have we learned through the work that we've done today? So how do we start, uh, Charles? How do we start moving away from that kind of learning mindset as we've been exploring there with, um, with David and Joe into a more performance focused mindset? Yeah, I think this is a, a major challenge that, you know, all of us face. And, and just uh, I think David is, uh, and Joe both explained some really important elements here that we need to focus on. And, and just to David's point about, uh, about performance, uh, an academic definition of performance is uh, behavior plus attainment. In other words, how you do things, uh, how you go about things plus you know what what the output what the results are and that's that's really what performance is uh and i think that joe's touched on that really important element of mindset and you know mindset underpins culture underpins everything and mindset change is really difficult in fact when i look at a, a the very few people that i really have been my guiding lights over the years i guess jerome brunner the great educational psychologist is one but another one's the the Irish polymath George Bernard Shaw, and Bernard Shaw said a great, great quote from Shaw about about change, and he said, "Progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything." Uh, and uh, I mean, Shaw was one of the only now two people ever to won 
uh, to win both a Nobel Prize and an Oscar. And I'll uh, uh, I'll give a prize for anyone who can, who, without Googling it, uh, tell me who the other one is. But uh, Shaw is also uh, was the first person who said success doesn't consist of making and uh, never making the same mistakes, but of never making the same one a second time. And and I think that that mindset change is really really critical. And and it's it's if we're going to move and to, to David's point, we're going to move from a learning mindset to a performance mindset. We have to think totally differently. We have to act totally differently. And to Joe's point about culture, I think that often when we talk about learning culture, and I actually don't like the term learning culture, it, it doesn't say anything to me, we're missing a word. So people talk about learning culture and we're miss we have a missing word in there because, and it's it's shown in very often where people say, oh, we don't have time to learn. Well, if your mindset is that you don't have time to learn, you're thinking about learning in a way which actually isn't the actuality of it, because that missing word in there is formal. So when people talk about learning culture, they're often what they're really talking about is how can we create a formal learning culture? How can we help people learn more? And the answer is, well, you don't help people learn more simply by providing them with more courses and programs and things like that. Sure, that may that may be part of the mix, but it's a relatively small part of the mix. What you do is help them learn through creating rich experiences for them, challenges, opportunity to reflect, opportunity to have conversations and build networks and practice and all those sorts of things. That's actually so uh, rather than the term a learning culture, I always prefer to use the, the term creating a culture of continuous improvement, because that then focuses you on the performance, not just continuous improvement for an individual, but also for teams, because none of us achieve our objectives individually. I, I know very, very few, if any, people who at the end of the year can sit back and say, well, I've hit all my objectives and I've done that by myself. Of course, we work in multiple teams and so on, but also at organizational level. And I think that we need to think about that uh, in terms of are we helping our organizations continually improve? And 70, 20, 10, I always describe it. I say, forget about the numbers. I mean, the original research didn't even show 70, 20, 10. In fact, it was 16 categories and it was highly complex, the academics that, that did the original work at the Center for Creative Leadership back in the 80s. I always describe 70, 20, 10 as a way to extend our thinking about how we help people and organizations do their jobs better. Uh, really, I, I, my, a lot of my work is around helping people's, people and organizations exploit what's already there. It's not about you know, designing a new course, as you said, uh, Rob, you know, so, uh, someone comes in and says, we need a new course on X, Y, Z. It's not about doing that. It's about carrying out proper performance consulting in other words, understanding what the root cause of a particular opportunity or a problem is and understanding what elements of that are down to people. And actually, we know that very often with opportunities, opportunities and problems, the element that involves people is not necessarily the major one. It might be, you know, you don't you have lack of clear leadership or crap processes or no processes or not the right tools or all sorts of things. So. From L and D, from L and D perspective, there's huge opportunities for L and D practitioners and professionals to really extend their role and start to really move from that that order taker into what I would call, we would call at the institute, uh, value creators. Because mm -hmm. if we stick with designing, delivering, or uh, delivering courses we're only going to be ever touching a little tiny piece mm. of the problem. And we're never, ever going to be value creators or change makers or whatever. Uh, that's really interesting. I, I think, you know, one of the, one of the scenarios I, I talk about quite a lot is when you look at customers of organizations. Um, now you think of some of the places I've worked again, like the likes of Sky and Talk Talk, then if a customer went onto the web, websites of those, of those organizations, we very much make sure that their journey is nice and easy. If they can't buy our products or navigate our systems with one login and as few clicks as possible, 
guess what's going to happen? They're going to leave. They become disengaged. They're not going to buy into what we're trying to sell them. And we don't sell anything. But quite often inside an organization, and this isn't, this is where I think, you know, the, the influencing that L and D need to have, they haven't, they can't always have the answers, but we need to influence a little bit more is to go. Why is it then that the agents that are sitting on the front line that, may also be selling something to that customer. They have to jump between four different systems with three different logins with a help system set up, explaining to them how to go through each of them. Well, you would never sell anything on the website by doing that. So why do we make it so much more difficult for those users within an organization? And for me, there's only a, there's only a short amount of time that can, can carry on before someone internally in an organization goes, why don't we just do that inside as well? And I'd love to see L&D pushing that piece. And I guess on that note, Satnam, some of the places that you've been working at, so you've recently joined uh, the, the Trust of the NHS at Imperial College, and you've re previous to that, you were at the British Red Cross. I know and we're talking about some great things that you can go away and do here and, and, and the way that we can uh, evoke a learning culture or a coaching culture or both or neither, all those sort of things. But you can't take away from the fact that the mission and the vision at the end of an organization, which sometimes isn't very clear, needs to be aligned to. Now, with the NHS and the British Red Cross, that mission is is pretty pretty big. Uh, and if you take everyone away on a three-day course while something's big happening, <laughs> so there's going to be serious consequences. So what's this like in the real world? And it's really interesting hearing everybody's conversation. Um, and, and, you know, I want to come from it from the perspective that I'm a, a lifelong learner. And to me, the term learning, uh, learn is just something that describes me because I do a, th a thing for myself, which is the learn of the day, whether that's a shortcut to the nearest station, you know, anything, because actually at every given point, we're learning something um, and it's instinctive to us. Um, and when we talk about a learning culture, it's a double-edged sword because people think they know what learning is, but it may not be what you think learning is. And, and so we have our PR already done, whether it's good PR or not, we, people know what the term learning is. You know, I'm also uh, very heavily into uh, organization development. You try asking people what that is and you get a complete, that is a, a minefield of things that people come back to you. Ultimately for me, it's around, and touching on what everybody said and yourself, Rob, about that customer experience. For me, it's about the people experience. I, you know, whatever you call it, we want to create inclusive cultures. Mm -hmm. And the areas that I've worked in, whether that's from when I was a, a, a scientist, a microbiologist, a public health consultant, you know, whether it's from those journeys to where we are now, we are learning on a daily basis that actually to us, to treat us, we need to balance the, the physical and the mental. And learning is part of that. But ultimately what we want our people to have is a sense of belonging. So once you get that right, it's that culture that you want to create. You want to create that inclusive culture. And learning and development uh, is past that journey. And past that journey is really giving someone that great people experience. Now for me, the people experience within the NHS is directly connected to the patient experience. Mm. You know, I need, we need people to be able to create to that community, people they serve. They want to be able to meet and greet the right person when they turn up at a &E. The you know, the anxious person who's going for a, to a hospital appointment, all of those things. And actually that inclusive culture, that real learning element of it is so critical. It's really critical to see that. And when I was in the Red Cross, it was the same thing. We always fundamentally thought about who was accessing us as an organization, what were their needs, and then creating that journey backwards. Like what, how do we create that connection between the person we serve to the person who we are in the organization. And ultimately what you're doing is creating a great people experience. You know, you want to have that, that, that portfolio of things available to you. You know, imagine spending the whole day on a broken chair, sat at a desk on a broken chair. You will not be happy. You will not, you might have had the best tech in the world. You might, you know, but just imagine just sat on a broken chair for the whole day. You will go away having a bad people experience. And it's all of those things. And learning and development is part of that. 
part of almost every layer of what we do. So for me, it's really about us being able to collectively think about what is an inclusive culture, who is our end user of that culture from that organization, and, and what is it that we want them to experience when they come to us. Um, and then you kind of work your way back around that. So those are the kind of things that we've been doing. And I've been part of that conversation with many organisations as well. I love that. It evokes a memory that back in uh, back when I was first getting involved in L&D, my first job in L&D was as a trainer in um, in the NHS in North Staffs. And I can remember we used to we used to train out. We were showing the age a little bit now, but it was uh, it was when they first rolled out Windows and Office XP to the uh, to the NHS. So we were brought in for that. But there was also the clinical system stuff, and we would train new A and E staff, as an example, on the software and the systems they needed to use. And you know, just just by doing that in a training room, sometimes you get really frustrated about why people just weren't picking it up or doing it. Until I got invited to go and sit in A and E for a few hours. And then it becomes really, really clear. You start going, wow, you know what? When 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 someone's like in front of you with their arm hanging off and, and blood pouring out, it's not as simple as, oh, just let me put you there while I just put this on the system. <laughs> and just, oh yeah, my password isn't the first thing in my mind at this moment. I need to get you onto this bed and get you sorted. Um, so I think, you know, immerse yourself and really make that connection. You know, who is that end customer? How how is their experience going to be impacted if you weren't there suddenly? And if the answer to that is it wouldn't be, then there's a there's a vision change there that's required to kind of go. Oh, well, how can we make it so we are having a positive impact on that on that end customer? Uh, and, and the other thing I think that you pulled out there, which I think is really important, is definitions. I think we can talk about learning. We talk about coaching, trust, even. I can remember with a senior leadership group, one of their values was trust. And I asked them all to write down independently a definition of the word trust. And also what their top three ingredients for building trust was. And yes, there was a lot of crossover, but there's also quite a bit of difference in between their answers. I'm like going, listen, if you guys all think about it in a different way, as you grow and, you know, 20 people become 50 and 100 and 200, and they all have different definitions of what we mean by that. How the hell can we expect it to form part of the fabric of the culture? Um, and then one, actually, one of the guys actually said to me, well, do we really need it? Can we just get rid of that one? So you tell me it's one of your values. Why do you want to get rid of it then? <laughs> <laughs> so really defi define it. Um, interesting. We've got, a, we've got a question. Coming I was going to say, we've got a question that's come through, Rob. Um, so, uh, so yeah, th this, this is a comment and a question, really. Um, so I'll read it all out in its in its fullness. Uh, so this comes from Ravi, uh, and Ravi says that different workplaces are in different orbits. I think we've talked a little bit about that already on this call. That different workplaces are at different levels on their journey, and you know different types of workplace cultures. Um, but Ravi says some workplaces are in a learning culture, some others are in a coaching culture, uh, and that he feels uh, that workplaces that have yet to establish a learning culture cannot jump straight away to a coaching culture. Is this a step-by-step -step journey? So your observations on whether a, a, a company or an organization that has no, uh, I guess, that it, it is light years away from some of the stuff that we're talking about today, can they jump straight into uh, a coaching culture or is it a step-by-step -step journey? Um, and I guess, should we, should we head to Joe first with that one, Rob, do you think? Well, no, I was immediately thinking of Joe because I was thinking about the uh, the framework to get to a coaching culture. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And do you know what? I don't disagree with Ravi on that point at all. I think, you know, when we talk to organisations, they're already somewhere on that journey of, um, you know, having, whether we're calling it a learning culture. Um, and we often say that we're not here to convince people that coaching is the answer if they don't already know that. We work with organisations who are already on that journey to know that coaching um, helps to change mindset and behaviours. Um, but whereas if you're if you're not even thinking about skills and knowledge, you know, as part of a learning culture, then, yeah, I think it is a step by step approach. And you are right. I have a cheeky little framework in front of me, how to build a coaching culture. And we've got a seven step framework to that. Um, about being able to visualize what that could look like and the benefits of it and how to go about achieving it. So Ravi, I do agree. Um, I think it is a step-by-step -step approach, but, but nonetheless, it is about 
making that start as well, making that um, step forward um, to, to start thinking about how can we create those environments for people to think differently? How can we help them to develop in their own job um, through great conversations with the people around them? Fab. That's brilliant. Thanks, Joe. Um, and should we bring in some of our experts, Rob? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I was naturally thinking then about uh, David because obviously we talk. You talk a lot about learning the flow of work and 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 linking into that performance element. How to what degree do we get caught up talking about learning and coaching cultures? And again, maybe theorizing to a certain degree. What instead of actually making some practical steps to make that change, and what might those practical steps first be? Yeah, so I, I think that um, uh, first of all, I'll, I'll state that we, I, I will only talk about my experience, uh, which is clearly going to be different from uh, everybody else's. I've never mm. worked in an organisation that would tolerate the language of building a learning culture or a coaching culture. Um, people would think that Disney's a soft place, or you know, and they'll, they'll you know, they'll be open-minded to, uh, uh, to to experiment towards this. But when I was there. They were going through a culture change. They were they were split away from. So I, I worked uh, in the European head office. Um, they 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 were making a, a conscious split from being so aligned to the US uh, and becoming uh, an entity in itself. And so the culture was becoming one of autonomy, uh, of uh, standing up for what we were. Uh, and if I had said to the Argentinian president of, the, of, uh, of Europe that we wanted a learning culture, a coaching culture, um, I don't think I'd have stayed in my job. Uh, he would have told me that he was really clear on the culture that he was seeking to develop. So I think that in my, you know, and that would have been the same at NatWest, that would have been the same at Lloyd's. Um, I think that, um, so again, talking from my experience, uh, I saw my role in helping the organization to achieve what the leaders had set out that we were there to achieve from a strategic perspective uh, as much as I possibly could. But it was much more tactical and operational, if I was absolutely honest. But it was but but big nonetheless, whether it was helping to merge entire functions, uh, whether it was seeking to equip uh, uh, entire countries to be able to uh, to to evolve. Uh, and uh, and do work differently to achieve different ends. Uh, and so I saw my role in uh, as understanding that as much as I possibly could and then supporting the, the organization to help achieve that. I wasn't trying to change the culture. I was there to uh, help help the leaders to translate what they were trying to do and, and, and do that. Um, uh, I, I, I would say that, uh, that, that earlier on in my career, uh, I, I did try to define people's roles. I'd write management development programs where I would try to rewrite the manager's um, job descriptions, but it didn't work because that's not what they were expected or rewarded to do. And so I think I became a much more pragmatic learning and development practitioner and then leader uh, and found a great deal of success with, with going with the grain uh, to, to help to improve the, the working lives of the people that work there uh, and the, their uh, abilities to um, assimilate with it and thrive within that culture. I couldn't have changed the culture in Disney. Um, there's a book called Disney Wars that explains exactly how political it is and it is ingrained into that organization. You don't, you don't create a learning culture in an, an organization like that. And in my experience, I, I've never worked anywhere where a learning culture was a topic of discussion or an aspiration. But again, my, my experience. That is really, really good experience and good, good, uh, good knowledge to share. Because that, that makes me think. So, if I come back to Charles, because obviously, Charles was seventy twenty ten. We're talking about an entire learning journey that should really tie into the performance of an organisation again. And realistically, if you're talking about everyone in an organisation, that includes all the leaders, the senior leaders, the first line leaders, the workers, everyone in there, and how all those people can join together with the with the various roles that you guys have have put in place that help the seventy twenty ten framework come to be. 
So that really does tie into culture. That starts to either generate or tweak. So I guess, you know, think tying into kind of David's experiences there, to what degree can L&D and HR kind of start to either look to change the culture or influence leaders to try and make them see that the culture could be different? Or should we stay out of it? Oh, Rob, that's a really interesting question. In fact, I I absolutely agree with David. You know, if you go in there thinking that you're going to change the culture or if you talk about a learning culture, you're probably going to end up down a, a blind alley and, and get very, very frustrated. Uh, I, I think the answer is L&D does have the opportunity to really have an impact on the, the culture of the organisation, but it has to do it in uh, right through the stack. So to, jo- to, to Joe's point uh, around the coaching, uh, absolutely the, the, the 20 in 70, 20, 10. And again, I should say that it's almost impossible to think about 70, 20, 10 as different buckets because there's always overlap. So, you know, any good, and, and we see this all the time, I'm quite often asked to have a look at maybe, a, you know, someone, someone contacts me or one of my colleagues and says, we've just developed this great leadership program, uh, this great 70, 20, 10 leadership program. Would you have a look at it? And it, uh, 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 to which, you know, immediately you say, well, actually, it may be a great leadership program, but that's not what 70, 20, 10 is about. And we call it 10 plus, you know, it's really good. It's great, great formal, a formal program, but that's got maybe some, some coaching in it and some experiential work in the, in the work, some learning in the workplace and so on in it, but it's, it's just part of it. I think the, the, the key element or the key, the essence of it is what we call performance-based you know, it's around, so we don't create learning journeys. We create performance and learning journeys, uh, learning and performance journeys. We're thinking all the time about how we're, we're, we're thinking at the, starting at the, at the result stage. So again, rather than thinking about, and I'm, maybe I'm going down a, uh, off on a, a, a sort of a, uh, a tangent here, but rather than thinking about how can we build competencies in this organization, we start to think, we think about how are we going to improve results in this organization? So you look at what the organization aspires to do and needs to do. And then, and again, you know, we, we've done a lot of work and my colleague, Jos Aretz is just writing a book, uh, which includes all this, which is thinking about, okay, what critical tasks does anyone in any role in the organization need to undertake in order to do their jobs well? And then you work back from there saying, how do we support them to people to, to undertake those critical tasks. Uh, and so that's one element element I think is really, really important. And uh, as you, you mentioned, you know, we we wrote a book, Jos and, and Vivian Hein and I wrote a book uh, seven years ago now called 70, 20, 10 towards 100% performance. And it's it's not a book to be read from cover to cover. It's a huge, great door stopping. I think you've got a copy of it, Rob. It's, a, have, yep. <laughs> it's a, four, a four pound weight door stopper. Uh, and it's, it looks like a coffee table book. Oh, you have a copy of it there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And but basically what that is, that is a, a set of processes and guides around five roles for L&D. It's basically re- reimagining L&D as performance centric. And there are, the roles are the performance detective carrying out performance, performance consulting work. There's the performance tracker. That's making sure that we identify what needs to be measured, how we're going to measure it, how we're going to demonstrate the value. There's the performance architect. In other words, how do we design the solutions that were that are needed, which are not just learning solutions, they're performance solutions. So they may be well beyond, you know, the course, the e-learning module. They may include those, but they'll be beyond that. And then there's the master builder, the performance master builder. That's, the, I suppose, in traditional L&D teams, that's sort of like instructional design on steroids because you're not just doing instructional design. You're actually designing solutions to solve the problems, which may involve learning and may not. And the last role uh, is what we call the performance game changer. And I've really seen this in organizations. In fact, we're working with, uh, and I was working for a long time before, uh, we, we set up the 702010 Institute with Citibank on their courses to campaigns transformation, where they were looking to transfer and, tra- and move, defocus on purely course based learning into thinking about, from a learning perspective, about campaigns to improve 
bits of the organization. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and so that role, the performance game changer, is all around how do we both manage the process, but how do we make sure that we're embedding the changes in the culture of the organization? And I, I'm not aware, maybe, maybe others of you here are aware of L&D being deeply involved in when we design a solution that we make sure that it really gets embedded and changes the organization, really gets embedded in the culture of the organization. And actually, when we started working with, uh, with Citibank, most of the meetings that I had and most of the activity around that performance game changer were carried out by the corporate comms and internal marketing people because they are really good at that stuff. L&D is not necessarily very good at that stuff. So uh, when you're thinking about <coughs> making these changes and we're thinking about what L&D does, we can't sit as an island. We have to actually work with others. And e equally, the tracker. I, I mean, again, David, I'm sure you have a lot of experience in this area. If you're looking to, to identify and demonstrate the value you're creating, in other words, getting the results and what you're going to measure, it's no point measuring learning. I mean, uh, you know, measuring activity, uh, measuring how many courses someone's done or that Charles can do this, uh, you know, the, the LXP type model, the, the, the uh, uh, tin can type stuff. That does, that's, that's activity measurement. What you're looking for is to measure outputs. And again, in my experience, the people who really do that are often, you know, maybe the finance person in that bit of the organization who works with the senior leadership team who are already collect collecting data. And you need to understand what data is meaningful for them. So the tracker does that sort of, that sort of work. So it's a totally different, I guess, not totally different, but different in many ways, way of thinking about learning, which is why we call perform it's performance-based learning. I really like the 70 to 10 framework for that reason, that it doesn't say you need to have these roles with these names and you need to rename them all within L&D. It says these are tasks that need to be done yeah. by somebody somewhere yeah. coming yeah. together. And I guess, you know, my, my thinking about that is that, you know, one of the one of the analogies I use is it's L&D starting to think a little bit less like a pharmacy and more like a GP that, you know, we've, we've not just got a, a wall of medication that you can come to us and say, right, have you got anything for that? Yeah, you go. There's an e-learning. <laughs> Take two a day and hopefully something happen tomorrow for you. <laughs> it's more if you go to the, the, the GP, the GP quite often, um, well, <laughs> based on some GPs I've seen uh, over the last few years, Google, Google it before they tell you anything. But anyway, that aside, <laughs> um, th th they might actually start going, okay, well, I'm not an expert in this, so therefore I'm going to refer you. But they're actually going to start asking you questions, not just about the first symptom that comes up or what you say is wrong with you. They're going to ask about when that happens, what context is that in, is there anything else going on? And if they might send you back to the pharmacist with a prescription. They might also go, we need to investigate this further. And I'm not the person that needs to investigate it because I don't have that answer or that skill set. And I think, you know, in that framework, it might be that, like you said, comms are the right people to do that. Mm -hmm. Leaders are the right people to do this. Senior leaders might be the people to do that. HR and so on and so on. So I kind of come back to, to Satnam and think from a, from a cultural point of view, how has that worked in the organisations that you've been part of in, in British Red Cross again and, and obviously kind of new in the NHS? And, you know, does that actually start to influence the culture it might not be as, as david was saying you're not going in with an agenda to create a learning culture or even a coaching culture but what you are doing is potentially influencing the culture by having different roles do different things not just within l d hmm. yeah I, I think it's a, it's really interesting because you get lots of people and uh, you know, for goodness sakes, I think the, the world has a change culture. Let's just put it that way, because all of us, there isn't an organisation we've not, not been to that's going for a change or go for a change. And lots is invested in a change programme. When, and when you sit down with a leader and you kind of go, you know, why are you doing this? There's sometimes there's real rationale, there's performance, there's efficiency, there's, you know, you know, I the sector I've worked in um, is all about delivering you know, more for less because, you know, our budgets are tight, all of those things. 
But if you were to pinpoint why they were doing this specific thing, nobody has got to that point where they can pinpoint it. And, you know, they want to create a culture. And I always start with, but you actually already have a culture. Good or bad, you've got a, a culture because, you know, you're not living or functioning without a culture. And I think it's really great to take your senior leaders through what they think good looks like and what it feels like. You know, walk me through, walk me through your office, walk me through your customer journey, walk me through what a person turning up to work today feels like. And it's really that that you have to navigate. It's really that journey to kind of go. And that's when you touch point going, well, actually, what you've just said there is a learning intervention. That's a coaching intervention because none of us got here without those things, whether we liked it or whether we thought it was great. You know, I changed from being a public health consultant who focused on epidemiology, gastrointestinal disease. Like, you know, you could not get more geeky at point. <laughs> and I went over, to, moved over to learning and development and pretty much commercial learning and development in the health sector. But because someone said, I think you can do this and I will help you. They didn't use the word coach. They didn't use the word, you know, I'm going to train you. They went, I will help you. And what they did was coach me because that's what it was about. It was coaching me to kind of understand that different narrative. Now, I think our jobs as professionals within this kind of field, whether it's coaching, learning, OD, people, but let's say we're in the people field, as a people field professional our job is to kind of highlight as they walk through what good looks like for them the touch points which is coaching and learn and you will not get a single touch point that is not a coaching point or is not a learning point from the minute you won't walk in just think of a physical building or even online think of that journey that you know you ask where's this room someone's going to teach you that where that room is someone's going to give you a direction there's going to be signposts that's learning someone's going to meet you at some point and they're going to do and as people professionals one of the things that i really strongly have stolen from when my work in the red cross <laughs> is recognizing when it is our time to lead when it is our time to advocate and when it is our time to champion it's recognizing that we cannot always be the leader at points we are going to have to step back and champion someone else someone else like comms or our finance people because they are going to do that and at times we have to advocate uh, the it system because that is how people are going to access their first point of learning and there are going to be times when we lead we lead the organization so it's sharing that people profession and really understanding that every element of what we do in a day is our work there is a touch point from everything that we do and it's mm. taking that journey and making your leaders see that vision that really sort of signposts them through now you know setting up and you know how i'm really passionate about inclusion and diversity it's a real mm. thing for me because i think belonging is so true we wouldn't stay in organizations if we didn't feel we belonged now you know, we've all got that bad experience of, of the multi-faith room being in a basement somewhere and, and all of those things. Now, that's what you have to navigate. You have to navigate what those things look like and what is your role as the people profession in supporting that to understand that individual's need versus the mass needs. And so for me, it really is those, you know, giving up the kind of almost that status, but just saying, I'm going to advocate something else because it helps the learning experience or it helps that coaching journey as well. And it's just really, as I said, it's that lead champion advocate. It, those are critical for us as professionals and to shine the light for our leaders to really kind of go, actually, sometimes I'm going to be there to just give you great signposting because that's all your organisation needs right now. It just needs to know that this is in the basement or this is on the seventh floor, you know, or this is in this file. And that's okay. Don't shy away from, like, just because someone's asked you to do a, a teaching moment, it's not a terrible task you've been asked to do. You know, embrace it. But other times you will be brought in as a leader, as someone who's leading a function for, for that, from that signposting to be able to create that vision. So for me, it's like no job is too small, but recognize how you create that into that vision. 
Yeah, really, really, really interesting because I think you know some of the things you said there. The certain the certain buzzwords that go around culture and the L and D quite often drive through the courses that they deliver. Things like coaching, things like feedback, things like emotional <coughs> intelligence, all those sort of things. And coming well, back to one of your answers earlier on, sat now around having a joint definition of these things. That you know, that I know again through the places that I've worked, if somebody told was told they were having a coaching session, they would be fearful of it. Because to them, what that meant was, I'm about to get a rollicking for my stats last week. That's why I'm being brought into this. Oh, can I give you some feedback? Uh-oh. What have I done wrong right now? So I think, you know, sometimes if you're in those sort of cultures, either spending the time to get in a shared definition of those things, but even before that, just stop using them. Mm. You just have a chat with someone. You don't even say, can we go and have a conversation? Just Start talking and listening. <laughs> um, if it's some, if, if it's feedback you've got, just just say what it is. Mm. Congratulate someone on doing something or help someone. Can I just give you something to help you there that I think could have been really good? Instead of saying, "Can I give you some feedback?" James, mm. if it just kind of come to you, come to yourself because I know you talk a lot about um, compassionate leadership. Yeah, and I was going to say, you know, one of my big phrases is stop using the word feedback. The minute <laughs> yeah. you say the word feedback, everybody's walls come up and they go, oh, I'm not listening to that. Um, so actually, as, as you said, my advice always with, with people who are managers and, and are leaders is to say to their people, can I help you with that? What support can I provide you with that? Can I give you a different different perspective on that? Uh, rather than saying, I've got some feedback for you on that. Um, so so absolutely, Rob, I think, you know, you, you're right. It's about creating those spaces where people feel uh, comfortable, but also we can have that radical candor at the same time and be open and honest with people uh, and create a space where that, that honesty is, is allowed. Um, and that is part of compassionate leadership, uh, mm -hmm. what compassionate leadership is, is all about. Um, so, See, I'm going to ask. Yeah. I'm going to ask you on that one because this is. Every, there's been times when people have said radical candor, and every time someone says, "What do you mean by that?" What do I mean, radical candor? <laughs> what do I mean by radical candor? I mean honesty, transparency, calling a spade a spade. Um, and I think that that people people need that, but it's about the way that message is delivered, and that's where the compassionate side of it comes about. Because I'm not giving you this. Uh, again, not to use that word feedback, but I'm not giving you this feedback to beat you over the head with a stick. I'm not giving you this feedback to show off how much cleverer than you I am or that, you know, I'm right and you're wrong. I'm giving you this feedback because I genuinely care about you. I want you to thrive in your career. I want you to do well. I want you to achieve that goal, that objective. I want you to achieve those results and be the best that you can possibly be. And that's why I'm being candid with you. And I'm saying that at this moment, you know, what is the, and it, it comes back really to having that coaching conversation that we've talked so much about already, you know, and, and saying to people, so what is it you're trying to achieve? Mm. Where are you currently? What is it we need to do to get you to where you need to be uh, and, and having those conversations with people? Um, but before I, I kind of move on, there was a couple of things that I just wanted to pick out from what was being said, um, Rob. Um, I also have another question that was sent in to me over LinkedIn. And then the other thing that's going on in my head, see, Rob's used to me, guys. My head is just like <laughs> booming with different things going on all the time. It's lots of stuff spinning. Is I know you said you wanted to do a short break at some point. Yep. So don't forget that as well, my friend. But I before I move in and start talking to you loads about compassionate leadership, because as I say, I'm so passionate about this. I could talk about it all day. Um, but before I move into that, um, Joe, you mentioned your seven step framework. Is there somewhere people can get that? Indeed, yes, I can. However you want me to share access to that. Um, I've got a, a, a flippable document that people can get access to um, happily. Don't ask me to do anything technologically <laughs> now. Please don't. don't no, no, no. Me. I was going to say, is, is, it, is it on your website or something like that? Can we dive yeah, into you can your download, website to yeah. head there? Yeah, you can download it um, from the website. So that would be a, a great way of doing that. Yeah. Brilliant. And what's that website, Joe? Um, www.coachingculture.com fabulous thank you so much and then charles you mentioned your book so uh, where can people get that book if they want if they want to find out more and read some more about your five uh, roles within l d or five l d roles james they can get a copy of the book from amazon uh it's a, a paperback it's not a it's not a lovely full full colored uh, job that rob's got uh, we've, we've actually 
run out of the English versions of that because it's published in Korean, and English, and Dutch. Uh, but uh, they can get it there, and also they can they can uh, get uh, other things from the institute website, which is just seventy twenty ten institute dot com. So there's lots of papers. For example, the the uh, I talked about Citibank, the case study around Citibank's courses to campaigns that uh, Brian Murphy, who was the head of uh, uh, performance and learning at Citibank for EMEA at the time, and I wrote. So that paper's there, you can just download that. So that's 7020 institutecom 702010institute.com, and they can download it there. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm thinking, James, maybe I could do a 702010 Jack and Nori session, and I can just sit here in front of the camera, read sections at a time. What do you, what do you think, Charles? <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you, yeah. Do you know Actually, what? That's that Korean be a... version, though, so it's probably not going <laughs> that, You've just given me a great idea for another L&D Mastermind event. Yeah. Book, book time with, with L&D Mastermind. Yeah, where Rob reads us a story. Um, <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, so I reckon, guys, I reckon this is probably a really good moment just to take that break. So I reckon a 10 minute break just more for us on the panel to go and grab a brew, toilet break, whatever we need. Uh, and I'm thinking when we come back, what I'd love to dig into a little bit more based on some of the things we've been talking about there is people versus performance, because I'm seeing, you know, what what is the, the main agenda for is what should be our motivation um but also uh, what are the things that get in the way of this and a number of questions i've had over the last week have all gone into one single bucket which is what when my leader or a senior leader just just doesn't want this but i do mm-hmm. uh, and then again i think we'll, we'll sort of maybe go into the coaching culture framework a little bit there joe because i know one of the first points of that is around gaining senior leader buy and they've got to be with that behind this um so those are the things i think we'll explore when we come back as well as some kind of tips on what are the first things we can do to start changing the way that we're viewed at work Okay, okay then. So uh, I just wanted to start off one of the, the questions that were sent through um, uh, uh, by a gentleman by the name of Graham Carter, and it was to Joe, um, which was, which leader have you worked with that's had the biggest influence on you and why? Yeah, it has to be my uh, my business partner, Adam Cara. Um, I've had a, a wonderful career through, you know, throughout all my career. Uh, but actually working with an entrepreneur, um, I call him the wizard behind the curtain. Um, I thought I had a growth mindset um, until I met Adam and everything um, can be achieved. Nothing, no problem is, it cannot be solved. It's it's phenomenal. Um, and I personally have developed so much just by being a co-founder of Coaching Culture um, it, and, and we're creating, I suppose, our what we would want in an organisation. We're creating something really special. Um, but actually working with Adam, nothing, nothing cannot be achieved. And, and that has really, really pushed me as well as learning how to coach as well. Putting this sort of working with Adam and learning how to coach the, the two together have, have been phenomenal for my own learning experience and personal growth. So, yeah, that's why. There you go. There, there's your answer, Graham. I've got a, I've got a question uh, a question for you, David. And this is actually uh, one of my questions that I wrote down about a week ago, saying I'm going to ask you: Have you got a favourite episode or guest of the L and D podcast? Oh dear! No, no, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, so I, so I don't. Uh, because uh, I'd say, and you know, this this isn't just me being diplomatic, but uh, the the opportunity to spend up to an hour speaking with people who are doing learning and development that matters is a is a huge privilege. Uh, but there are um, certain certain times in the the three years that I've been doing it that I refer to one episode more than any other. And the ones that I have been referring to most recently have been the ones that uh, I've uh, I've spoken twice with Sebastian Tyndall on the podcast in the last year. Uh, one on the podcast, and one on the uh, the Pivot to Performance series that I did with uh, with Guy Wallace. And yeah. um, Sebastian always speaks so candidly about the approach that he's taken, and so generously about uh, about that that I think that he's able to. That anybody listening will be able to, to to formulate for themselves how they can apply similar principles and achieve an enormous amount more. So I'd say that uh, that that 
that those have been great. And again, with the Amory Burbage, who takes a, a similar approach. But um, if I, I give an, an honourable mention to, to Tracy Waters uh, when she was at Sky, uh, who I, I spoke with, I think, in August 2019. So right at the start, uh, that was all, uh, uh, also a, a hugely enlightening one, again, for her generosity and, uh, and, and how candid she was. But look, those, those are just some. I've, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed all the conversations and I, I get messages from, from folks about uh, individual episodes that that are long gone in my memory, so uh, uh, which are always a good reminder. But uh, but far from being favourites, those are the ones that that, that I, uh, I I I urge people to listen to if they're going to jump in and listen to any to begin with, and hopefully they'll listen to a few more when they do. Hey, do you know off the top of your head what how many episodes you've got of that now? Uh, we're approaching a hundred, so I think that uh, wow. that uh, I think uh, I think we're, we're something like ninety two or ninety three uh, now brilliant stuff yeah i'd encourage everyone if you've not if you've not uh, listened to that podcast i think it's on all the usual podcast platforms isn't it david so the md yes. podcast learning development podcast you will see david's uh, face on the cover if you uh, if you give it a quick search in there as well so please go uh, go ahead and, and search for some of those so getting back into the the conversation i guess one of the things that uh, kind of reflecting in that 10 minutes there that really came across to me is that I wanted to ask the question when I came back around, well, what is it then? Is it people or is it performance that we should be focusing on? And kind of one of the reflections I had in those 10 minutes was there seems to be the, a big it depends that floats around all of that. It, it's organisational specific. It could be driven from the, the, the vision of the, the leaders, the size of the organisation. So our priorities and our, our own vision and mission might change. So to... to, to to uh, Charles's point, we might still have training teams whose mission it is to create training because they concentrate on the 10 piece. And then other people will focus on the other stuff. So I guess I wanted to, to kind of re rephrase that and say whatever it is that your mission is. So people watching this now going, I'd really love to kind of push this so we, we are more people focused or I'd love it to push it so we're more performance focused. Whatever that aim is, what are the blockers that seem to come up when L and D try to influence what's going on or change the way that they work to become more performance or people focused? Uh, and I guess you know I'm going to go straight to, to Satnam on this and say uh, just because again I can imagine in the organisations you've been part of that that, that is a challenge sometimes. Um, what is it? Is it people? Is it processes? What 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 gets in the way sometimes? Um, I think for me, it's it's always going to be people focused. My um, the work I've done will 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 show you that my personal portfolio, as well as like the organisation I worked with, it, it's always going to be people focused. And but you know we shouldn't shy away from performance, and we shouldn't shy away from efficiency. Uh, and ultimately, you know, we are we are a pe my for me, it's being a people fo focused organisation that drives good, you know, performance. And that's the journey we need to take. Um, you know, if I go back to sort of health health challenges and and the era that I, I most know, you know, we know that people are impacted in so many ways. Poor housing results in poor health. You know, so think of all of those things that you live and breathe on a daily basis. And actually, you know, we have to be people focused. We must make sure that our people are supported and, you know, looks after. And performance is part of that conversation to have and to drive. But we have to start with the person first. Um, they need to feel that we care as organisations. We care about their well-being. We care about their development. And part of that journey is also then sharing your vision about what is it that we want to perform and we know that it's a cycle isn't it we mm. know that there's enough stats out there that tells us tell us that high performing organizations you know are great learners i have great uh, retention have more of a good vibe culture you know all of those things so we have to go through that people point and it's always going to be people for me first and then it's that using that channel to drive performance. So then that 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 to me is never going to performance is never going to outdo people. It's, we are in the people game. Um, so I think that has to be key. But we mustn't shy away from performance or efficiency. You know, th these are not dirty words. They really aren't. You know, because 
ultimately what you're trying to do is make something you know you're you're aiming for an improvement you're aiming for a, an efficiency that improves uh, whether it's taking that early analogy of you you know is reducing the 10 clicks down to three you know it's all of those and part of it is we can do that measurable part of performance as well like what has that impact meant um and that's what we're trying to do it's turning the conversation around that we've got great you know intent to work with our people and we want to drive the impact of that will be great performance mm -hmm. uh, bringing that on to, to charles then so you think that, uh, that overall performance when we're trying to roll this out and, and in the way that satnam's talking about what are the challenges that you see? Because I saw that one of the one of the comments or one of the questions you got asked, I think it was on the L and D Mastermind group in the lead up to this event, and I know you chipped in with a, a short answer in there as well, was um, that 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 people don't seem to buy into it, uh, or that people might challenge it and not want to work in that way, um, whether that's because of a disbelief of it or resistance to change, whatever it might be. W what are those main kind of oppositions? to actually really refocusing the way that we either work ourselves in L&D or are trying to refocus others to work? Yeah, I think there are some, some barriers that L&D really needs to address, and some of them are really challenging. First of all, I, I used to work with a man called Jay Cross who died in 2015, and many of you will know of Jay. You know, he wrote what I think is still the best book on informal learning that's been published. Uh, Jay often said, the trouble is a lot of people can't separate or differentiate between learning and schooling. And so that's why we have this situation where many managers will say, we're rolling out a new system or we've, we, we need training. And so because we've got this schooling mindset, but even beyond that, and, and to Satnam's point, I think that, you know, we know that, that people that uh, people are critical, our organisations, they're, they're critical not just in terms of the fact that they're people, but in, in economic terms as well. I mean, uh, uh, the Boston Management Group did a, uh, a study, a longitudinal study that showed that the uh, intangible assets in organisations in the past, uh, I guess in the industrial age, the tangible assets, i.e. buildings, structures, plant, materials and so on, were the major elements on a, on a balance sheet. And by about 2009, the intangible assets, in other words, people, brand, those sorts of things, constituted about 70%, at least 70%. I have no idea what the figure is today, but I'm sure it's not for that. So therefore, you know, our people are important. And every, you know, every leader I've ever come across has always said our people are our most important asset. Well, yeah, of course they are. Uh, absolutely. But we have to think about performance in terms of not just individual performance but organizational performance and the people make up part of that so i see it as a sort of a uh, an expanding ring basically in other words the people are critical but the performance involves elements other, other than people and so i think the challenge that lnd has is that lots of leaders and managers see lnd as totally people focused and basically totally training focused. You know, they're the people we go to to do our onboarding training, to do our training when we're putting in a new process. I mean, I uh, when I was working as a chief learning officer, I had some big barneys with uh, program boards because they had a 10% figure of training in their rollout of a new system or process, and they just assumed that that involved, you know, putting people in front of others in the classroom and running, and, and I absolutely refused to do that because I wanted to do the analysis before <laughs> to understand what the needs were. So I think that the challenge and, the, and I guess the barriers that L&D needs to focus on is how do we change that mindset around thinking that, learning is schooling or that you know that the problem solving performance is all about is all about learning and all about people and thinking at it holistically and it's it's not easy it's a really difficult difficult challenge you know those are difficult challenges and i often if you can just bear with me for a second but i often tell a story about a man called admiral sir james lancaster now some of you historians will, will know better than me because you know i didn't grow up in this country but lancaster was queen elizabeth the first's uh, is an admiral in Queen Elizabeth I's Navy. In fact, he was the the head of the of the of the, of the English Navy at the time, uh, responsible for India and the Far East. And Lancaster 
demonstrated why change is really, really difficult. He demonstrated it. He didn't mean to, but he demonstrated it beautifully. He was a, a bit of an amateur scientist. He's a very clever guy. He, he was born and brought up not far from me here in Hampshire. But uh, in 1601, he, he took uh, a flotilla of boats from Torbay in Devon to go to India. So, you know, obviously the Suez Canal wasn't there, so he had to go around via South Africa. And he had an idea, and you'll all know the story, uh, well, you know the, the essence of it. He had an idea that a lot of the deaths of sailors uh, on journeys like that, which might be three or four months, uh, it was due to scurvy. He didn't know it, they didn't know it as scurvy at the time, but he realised that, that Lancaster thought this. So in 1601, he took these four boats off, and he, on one boat, he decided, to he decided to carry out an experiment. And on one of these four boats, which happened to be the one he was commanding, he prescribed three teaspoons of lemon juice to the crew on every day. And, uh, you know, we all know this now, but it wasn't known then. By the time the flotilla had reached South Africa, uh, Cape Town, uh, 110 men out of the 280 or so on the other three boats had died. And that was pretty common. So 40% mortality rate was, was quite common. No one on Lancaster's boat had died. In fact, he had to he had to leave Port and go out and help one of the one of the other boats and the flotilla in. So he, he came back to uh, he came back to England and reported to the uh, the Admiralty the result of this of this little experiment. And the Admiralty acted. However, it took him 194 years to act. So in in 1795, the English Navy enacted guidelines for lemon or lime juice for sailors. And then it took another 70 years until 1865 until what was the, then the British Board of Trade said, oh, maybe this should be also applicable to people who are in non-naval, in other words, merchant seamen. So it took 264 years to get that change to occur when there was good evidence. It was only one experiment. But there, were, there was a lot of other work done in the intervening period, of course. Mm. So everyone knew what was the right thing to do. There was evidence-based, a good solid evidence base that we should do this. But getting that change was really, really difficult. And I think uh, I tell that rather long-winded story because I think for L&D faces a real problem in that you're not going to change people's minds by convincing them with just evidence alone. You have to do a whole range of other things in order to to do that. And I think the barriers, to, you know, absolutely to your point, Rob, the barriers that L and D need need to address is how do we demonstrate impact? How do we gather data to show results mm -hmm. that will prove that we need to do this, do things differently? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I could give you quite a number of, of specific cases of examples. I, I can give you one very br brief one. When I was at Reuters, uh, the the head of uh, support, the support centre in uh, in the US, in St. Louis, contacted me and said, Charles, you know, we're spending a million dollars a year training our people uh, to support our products. And our customers tell us that our support centre staff don't know our products. And I was pretty sure that the support centre staff really knew the products. We, you know, they were trained absolutely. And uh, so we did a performance consulting piece of work. We went out and we sat with the with the uh, support centre staff. And these are people who know Reuters will know that it's not just a news organisation, that most of its revenue comes from selling data into financial services. And so these, these support centre people were mainly answering questions and solving problems for people on trading floors. Uh, mainly principally alpha males, you know, who were doing a big trade and something went wrong with their data feed or the data or something, and they'd call up and shout and scream down the phone. And what we realised very quickly in terms of doing that analysis was that the solution was probably a training solution, but it wasn't more training on products. Mm -hmm. so the problem was these support centre people, when they had an angry customer calling them up and abusing them, they didn't know how to manage that difficult conversation. Uh, and that became really clear really quickly. And it was only because the head of centre had allowed me and a team to go in to sit and listen to these conversations over a couple of days to understand what was happening. And I think for L&D, the challenge is actually being able to push back and say, okay, you want a new course on this, let's step back 
and look at what the real cause of the problem is and let's mm -hmm. unpick it. And then we can start. And that's when moving into the wave makers and the value creators, that's when it'll really happen because otherwise we just get, you know, I could have devoted a team to develop more product training. We could have put everyone in, the, in that support centre through more product training. It would have had no impact whatsoever. I, I think that I think that's crucial because I think, you know, I'd, I'd extend that to some of my experiences to say that, those difficult conversations quite often when you've got that that person in your ear and a headset on and they're, and they're shouting at you for whatever reason it might be, if you're working in a complaints department, let's say, for example, it kind of ties into the other things I said earlier on that, yeah, that might be putting you off like what you're trying to do. But if you're trying to balance five different systems at the same time, whilst looking at a process to help that person whilst being shouted at, and then having to take two minutes to do it when they need an answer immediately, all of this stuff is, is coming together like a, a perfect storm to make it really difficult for you. Mm -hmm. And again, L and D in their own right, aren't going to well, certainly solve that with anything, but how can we start, if we notice that, who do we need to influence with that? And I guess, you know, it, Joe, I know that it, it, one of the one of the, the questions that's come across a lot over the last week linking into that is that those people that do get in the way of this, this change. Now, change is an interesting thing because I I think it's a little bit like the word coaching and feedback again, that we all think of it, that it's this horrible thing that nobody wants and we all fear it. Yeah, I defy anybody. Like, go out to your organisation, be a fly on the wall every single person complains about what's going on at work at some point <laughs> and the fact that what they would like to see change. So we kind of all want it, but apparently we all hate it as well. Um, so in terms of like that influencing piece, I know at the, the start of the framework, you've got the senior leaders uh, a key to this, to actually making this change and making it a cultural change. Um, but even as far down as your own individual line manager, why, how is it, how do you go about starting to influence upwards to conduct this change or change the way we work? I think it's, um, I think it is about opening up honest conversations. It's back to the words radical candor. It's about being honest and having your opinion heard. Um, and, but again, I think the leadership and throughout, well, throughout the whole organisation, there needs to be that safe environment to, to do so. So while, while ever the word feedback's getting a bit of a, a bashing today, <laughs> you know, if, if we change our perspective on what is feedback, and actually it doesn't, it doesn't have to be something to be feared, it can mm. be something that we feel safe to be able to give and receive, then so much more potential can be unlocked within teams, and the whole organization. So how do we need to go about influencing? Let's start having those open conversations up and down the organization. So let's make this two way. It's not just top down and it's not just bottom up. It's it's let's open up more and more conversations and share, you know, leadership teams need to be asking and listening. Mm -hmm. Listening is a key one here. And as you as you would know, I'm going to say these are all skills of great coaching conversations. <laughs> um, and, and just really create that environment for honesty mm. honesty and i'm good to james's camera's not on because you know <laughs> compassion you're not going to believe this the window cleaner's just turned up Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> fabulous i've got a brush at my window ask um, them what they think about this no, no, I'm not. I refuse. That's quality. That is, that is a first. No, um, the window, though. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tempt me. I am on the third floor. Um, so where was I going with that now? The window cleaner's really thrown me. Um, oh, James being on the screen. Mm. Compassionate leadership. I think that and, and that style of leadership and authentic leadership where, you know, those just building the right environment trust let that's where influencing can start happening you know where people are open to having those conversations and doing something with that information 100 percent, joe you're, you're <laughs> absolutely on my level and as i say it's a shame that my camera isn't working because i was nodding my head at everything you were saying so 100 percent, compassionate leadership it's it's so necessary uh, particularly in organizations today in a post-covid world where you know we, we know the great resignation is happening. 
people have woken up and suddenly gone, do you know what? I'm not prepared to be treated like an asset anymore. I'm not a robot. I'm not here to burn myself out. Um, and, and people are leaving jobs everywhere. Yeah. And so compassionate leadership is so needed because we have to create that environment where people feel uh, like they belong. They feel like they're safe um, and, and they feel like they can be honest and we can have those honest and open conversations. And that will only come about through creating what I call professional intimacy. Again, I could talk all day about this stuff, but that comes about through, you know, um, listening, empathy, understanding, and really creating that psychological safety where people can open up and they feel yeah. they can. Now, how that links into L&D is that, you know, as an L&D um, person in an organization, you know, we need these this compassionate leadership as well. So we need to be... Um, creating that space. Um, you know, we talked a lot today about learning by doing. Uh, and yet I see so often in organizations, people who say, oh yeah, yeah, we want to create an environment where people can learn by doing. But the minute they get it wrong, boy, we're going to tell them about it. And we're going to give them some feedback and put them on a performance plan and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, that, that's, that's not learning by doing. You're, you're creating an environment of fear where people will not try things. People will not learn by doing because they're scared to try anything. So from an L&D perspective, we've got to create within that organization a space where people can learn by doing, where people are not scared to make mistakes because they know they're supported. They know that we're here to, to help them to develop. Um, and that, as I say, comes about by creating that empathy, that understanding, uh, and and treating people like people to go back to that people versus performance. If we treat like people, the performance will come uh, because then we can start to have those radical candor conversations with people because they feel safe to have those conversations, uh, and then we can improve the performance. Yeah. And as I say, I, I could talk about this stuff all day long. <laughs> As Rob do. knows. Yeah, I often do. <laughs> I think, you know, if I was, play, if I was going to play devil's advocate for, into mm. that, I, I would go, and this is this, this is an analogy that I know you know I've used before, James, is that mm. one of my favourite footballing analogies, in fact, if you look at someone like, what you're talking about there is you look at someone like Liverpool Football Club, you Jurgen Klopp has got this idea around him or this image around him that there, there's a certain element of compassionate leadership going on there. There is a relationship with the fans, there's a relationship with the team, there's a team unity, and all that has taken a while to grow. And now that it's stronger than ever, there's performance and results are coming in exactly the same way that you, you're talking about there. Mm. Now, there are lots of leaders out there and senior leaders, particularly who have spoken to in the past, that might go draw draw a comparison to someone like Chelsea Football Club. And say, over the last, I would say now, what we're on, 15, 17 years or so, um, Chelsea have worked in a completely different way. That They haven't gone around nurturing relationships within the club. They've not sought to grow trust amongst players, managers, staff. Um, we've seen things like Jose Marino shouting at physios on the pitch. We've seen managers come and go and get sacked, even though they were two months ago they won the European Cup. We've seen players come, uh, been bought in, and then their careers nosedive afterwards. However, I cannot sit here and say Chelsea Football Club have not performed well and been successful over the last seventeen years. It's a completely different philosophy in, in that sort of in that sort of way. And, you know, famously, Jurgen Klopp said, I think we will win a title within the next four to five years. And I'm pretty adamant that if a Chelsea manager came in tomorrow and said it'll take us five years to win the league, they'd probably get sacked the next day. So 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 what would you say to those leaders that kind of go, I think I can do it without all this compassionate mumbo jumbo trust conversations, all that sort of stuff. My my business here is to, to make money and get results. OK, I would say take a step back and let, take a look at the wider picture if we're going to compare the two. So look at how many. And again, sorry for anyone who's not into football and, and, it, and, and apologies to anyone who may be a Chelsea fan listening to this. But how many young players came into that Chelsea team, were not allowed the opportunity to flourish and develop and reach their potential, and have now gone on and flourished and reached their potential elsewhere. Look at the sustainability mm -hmm. of those two different models um, and then the amount of money that has had to be pumped into in order to achieve those results, as opposed to where it has come from developing young talent and giving young talent the opportunity to reach their potential. So if I then switch that back into organizations, 
I would say, what's sustainable within an organization? Can you keep just churning staff constantly? Can you keep just train, having to retrain and bring people in and do induction again and again and again and again? Or is it better to build a sense of belonging within your organization, have loyal employees, have people who um, are driven by the purpose of the organization, feel like that's where they, they're, they're home uh, and they, they want to do well for your organization? I know what I'd far rather have in my organization uh, and I know the environment that I'd far rather work in. Um, so, so yeah, that would be my answer to, to that one, Rob. I, I mean, absolutely. I, I would far prefer to be in that environment, but I, I, I know senior leaders who go, well, I don't need it. I'll do that. And I guess, you know, David, if I come to you on that point, can kind of explore your thoughts on that, because I guess this links, this begins to link to what is return on investment? What does that look like when it comes to, learning teams and L&D teams that, you know, there's a school of thought that it's impossible to measure our return on investment as opposed to actually it's not impossible, but it needs to be far different to what it is now. And it needs to tie into exactly what that head of or that senior or CEO actually cares about. What's your, what's your thoughts on that? Um, so I don't think it's impossible to measure uh, what we do, but you can't measure it the way we do it. Um, when learning and development is topic centric and you have your, le- your management development, you have your communication skills, your time management, your presentation, you isolate skill sets, you remove from them from the work that people actually do and where they actually perform. You turn it into an educational exercise. So you fill their heads based on the theory and then you put them back to do the hard work, which is when they've experienced it just the once and they're not learning experts, they then translate it to their job. Funny enough, it doesn't work and people just go back. And we say this to them as trainers, you know, nothing changes if you don't transfer this back to the workplace. They go back to the workplace and they don't remember it. And it's no fault of theirs. They're not designed to remember it. We're not designed to. They've experienced, they've been exposed to content for the very first time. Many of them don't know why they're there uh, and what they experience doesn't relate to what they do. I remember doing, um, uh, having a, a presentation skills uh, program and I, I loved it. I think we brought this, uh, this uh, facilitator in uh, it talked very much about how um, the, um, the the technology should complement the message, should never overlap. So we sent people on this course, we brought this in, and then um, uh, people then gave them the feedback. No, our leaders need the slides. This doesn't work. So we had to strip it out. Learning and development isn't idealistic. And when we when we deliver topic centric programs and, uh, you know, building on what we've just been discussing there, one of the biggest wastes of money globally in learning and development is management and leadership training, because we try to do this. We um, and this is also why there is a deficit in management and leadership skills in this country, which is impacting on productivity as well, because we continue to do the same stuff. We deliver content, idealized content that doesn't relate to the job. And we expect people who aren't skilled in this, who've experienced it for the first time, to take out what is relevant and then use that in the workplace. It's bananas. What we don't do at all is understand what it is that they're in the organization to do, what they're not able to do efficiently or effectively, and help them over a period of time to do that stuff. You talked about uh, uh, about Jurgen Klopp versus Chelsea. I'm a Chelsea fan, and we have a chant that says, we know what we are. We're champions of the world. We know what we are. Uh, and if it was easy to, to train managers uh, and then sheep dip them and then, and then produce Jurgen Klopp's, we would have 20 of them in the Premier League right now. Jurgen Klopp is genuinely authentically himself and you have 19 other managers who are probably genuinely authentically themselves and we had an Andre Villas-Boas so did Spurs and he was authentically himself and it didn't work you know well he, I think that he would he tried on a mask uh, that that wasn't genuinely himself and I think that uh, that he may have may, may have refined his approach over time but you but but you can't just say you do that or you be that I think that the only way, and going back to your, your question now, Rob, how do we measure our value? Well, we mm. measure our value when we, instead of delivering topics, we try to uh, isolate and understand critical points of failure in our organization. If there is a problem, there is data. And it's not about what people do, it's what people are there to achieve. And some of it might be um, uh, what people do, but it's the outcome of what they're, that they're trying to do, or what they're not able to do. 
when we're working from critical points of failure and we can work with the people who are responsible for the work itself, then we have a ground zero. We could say this is a problem. So instead of saying our middle managers need to have courageous conversations because, well, why not? I can convince everybody in the organization that by having critical, uh, by courageous conversations, they, they can do their job better. You can convince them to buy into it at that point. But you, if you can't isolate the actual problems that courageous conversations is there to actually help with, then you will never measure the outcome. You will only ever measure bums on seats. And then in a year and a half, when everybody's been through the program and the, 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 the fizz has run out, you just move on to the next thing. And people will be asking, was, was there a return on, like, uh, on our investment there? It's the silliest question. Of course there isn't. There can't possibly be. <laughs> Because we didn't know what the problem was. We went round hawking a solution around like it's the next silver bullet. And this is where we go wrong in L&D. Because we're always chasing the next silver bullet. Purpose-driven leadership didn't work last time. So now we're going to try this one over here. But we still haven't figured out what the problem is. But what we do is we say that it's this group of people because they can't do X. And it's not. The only way we can measure the impact of what we do is to understand the problems before we get involved. There's data to say that there is actually a problem. And going back to your, uh, your, your question at the outset, is it people or performance? In my perspective, it is, it's human-centered design. It is what people are in organizations to do. And if you ask them what it is that they want from learning and development, yes, yeah, some people will say, I'd like to go on a course every now and then. But the people who we really want to influence will say that they want to be able to do the job better and faster and improve their prospects. The reason that they are in organizations. So when they hit the LMS and there are 10 million bits of content, there's an exhaustive curriculum and they've been chosen to go on a course. It just doesn't matter in the long run mm. if you're not helping people with the primary reason that they're in organizations. And I think that in learning and development, we flit across the top with our idealized designs of what, what leadership should be, what the culture should be, what the experience should be. And it all happens underneath there with people's gritty reality of what they experience on the job, the reasons that they are, that they are successful, the reasons that they're not successful, the reasons that they feel that they're, they're blocked. And if we did more analysis, I think to, to Charles's point earlier, if we spent more time analyzing to figure out what it is that people are expected to do and what they're not able to do easily or effectively, we'll find that there's data on that if there's a real problem and our work becomes meaningful and impactful. But if we just dance around the top uh, looking for the next silver bullet, I'm afraid, um, to Charles's point, it'll be another 284 years before learning and development <laughs> figures out it's, done some, it's been doing it all wrong as well. Just give out some lemon juice mm. quick and uh, <laughs> sort them, sort, <laughs> sort them problem. Yeah. I, th I think that's, I think that's really, I think it's fascinating. I know an episode mm. of the podcast that I did with Nick Shackleton Jones, he talked about pizza and pizzerias, and he said, you know, it's a great thing you can go and give out pizza in an organisation, and everyone will come and get that pizza, and everyone will love that pizza, but it hasn't solved anything, and the next day people have forgotten about the pizza, but everyone loved it. And that's the same as putting on just the training courses. Everyone will come along, they love it. And the next day, it, it didn't do anything. Um, and I think, you know, your, your, your conversation there about data becomes really interesting as well. Because I think I, I've seen L&D teams that kind of jumped on that bandwagon of data and interpreted that that meant they need to show more of their data. Whereas actually what it really meant was go and dig out the data that really matters in the organization that proves where the problems lie, where the opportunities are, and seek out how you can either directly or indirectly influence improvements in that. How do you go about it? One exercise I, I, I do quite a lot, and, and again, anyone uh, watching the video at the moment can kind of do this. Typically kind of think of the, the common request you might get through um, and, and what's the driving point for that. So whether that's customer satisfaction, it's NPS, it's profit, whatever it might be, something that the CEO will care about, not you and a training team, what they will care about. And then actually just do a little activity and think to yourself, what are all the things in an organization Every single thing you can think of that impact that particular metric, that stat, that target, whatever it might be, either to improve it or that might take away from it. And then look at all those things that you come up with and maybe ask a few other people around you as well and start to say, how many of those things can we directly influence with a training course? How many of those things can we directly influence with an e-learner? 
And then the next time they kind of come along and say, right, what we want is we want a big training program to go out to help people improve CSAT. There's the focus point of your, uh, your performance consultancy conversation to go, okay, let's look at all the things that are going to influence that. Is this really the right way of going about it? And I guess on that point, Saturn, if I come to you and kind of go, you know, ROI, what, what, how has that been measured in the places that you've worked? I mean, what have you been challenged with what that should look like? Have you managed to kind of come up with an answer to it to, to show that you're valued or oh, is it still I, as difficult as everywhere else? I'd love to know that I've come up with an answer. I can <laughs> tell you what I think, but not necessarily if I've come up with the answer. I guess it, it's it's a couple of things and I'll try to kind of connect the conversations we're having. Hmm. You know, for me, I think it's really about that authentic leadership all the way through. And I think there's a real shift in 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 at us as people people I and I was in a dinner yesterday and I was talking about this that when I joined the workforce I, I was you know my role models to that point like my parents and everybody that had gone you know had been at work were very much like hard work you know and just keep your head down don't say anything you know and it was almost like we were we turned up to work and we conformed to the culture good or bad we conformed to it but, you know, as the world has progressed and as things so much has progressed, we are now at that point as human beings, you know, we want to be a place where we truly belong, where I can be me, where you can be you. And I think there's a lot of difference in that. And and actually some of our models is what the problem is. Our models are set in that bit, which is still conforming, you know, and you know, it's it's also for me what I said earlier, which is we can collect really great data points. Now I can tell you how many people have done mandatory training in my organization. And that's the figure someone will ask me and I'll go, is this much? And they'll go, tick, well done, Satman. But it's a bit like great intent. You know, yeah. there is always going to be great intent, but what is the impact? You know, what is the impact we're trying to achieve through that? What is the learning and the long-term impact that we want to achieve? So for me, it's really about having that measure of what that impact is. It's knowing that your data is supported by the experience that people are having. You know, and I, you know that I'm very, uh, you know, I'm very mindful about how inclusion feels and how diversity feels in organisations. And there is so much we collect. We collect data points and everything. But I don't think we've ever stopped as organisations and said, are we collecting the right data point? Mm. You know, if you... If you've got a you know a contactless card, you are measured. You are we are all scanned. We've got data points everywhere. Now none of those make any difference to us. You know we're going on with our life. I'm still spending the way I want to spend. I'm still whatever. And I I thought I have this version of how I think my system's going to work. But it's really knowing what is the data point that we want to collect, and knowing what is that that we want to reflect back. And I think it's just. It, it, it is that that we lose so much of. We lose so much of, we measure so many things. We literally measure so much in organizations. Every organization has so much data that we're almost overloaded with data and we don't know what the impact is. This whole thing about the great um, resignation, people are leaving because ultimately they don't feel they belong. They don't feel they have a voice. And organisations need to stop being the voice of their people. They need to create space for people to have a voice. And it's really, that's the bit that we need to measure. We need to measure, are you feeling happy today? As, as well as, are you, you know, how was, you know, how, how what, have you done your data? Whatever the needs are. We, we need to build the together. We cannot now distinguish between, here's your metric for your mandatory training, and then go, but we're, we've got a high turnover. Why? It's mm. going back to that root cause because you ultimately need to understand that someone that you're asking to travel for maybe four hours to get into an office is having a really bad journey. And that impact is going to be all the way through that day. And it's mm. really that. We need to start thinking about measuring impact as opposed to great intent. Yeah, I think that bridge between impact as you said and, and the results that come off it and identifying i i use the example quite often of a, of a sat nav and going you know sat navs are really good at this you know where you are you're programming where you're going and if you go off track it, it, it gets you back it chooses a different route if it needs to 
Whereas we quite often just kind of go off that track and then just keep going until something tells us otherwise. Uh, Charles, how about yourself? What, what's your thoughts on the, the kind of ROI conversation and well, how we prove it? Yeah, I, I think both what Satnav had said, absolutely. I agree with every word David has said about measuring and, and about impact. And uh, I think that measuring the impact of individual learning interventions is a, a, a waste of time and will be highly unlikely to ever show, you know, to, to be able to show that. Uh, and, and a lot of a lot of effort, time and effort is put into that. And I think that it's, uh, you know, there are certainly are ways to, to measure impact. I think learning and development can can have a big impact. But I think it's a matter of, again, doing that, that upfront work, understanding what people need to do, to, to, to David's point, about understanding, you know, what, what they're expected to do, what they can do, you know, what's going to be best for the organisation. And, and as I say, you know, I've, I've been highly critical and still am of competency frameworks. And my God, I've been involved in spending, you know, lots of time in terms of developing them and working with them and skills matrices based on competency frameworks. They're generally great. I mean, hey, management consultants, consultancy has earned billions out of you know, defining their job, you know, job families, job roles, and frameworks and coming into competency frameworks. And so they might be useful, but actually they take a hell of a lot of effort I at one stage had 17 people in my L&D team working on defining specific skills for specific job roles. Uh, absolutely crazy in retrospect to, to be able to, to put in that sort of, uh, put that amount of effort. I think that, I'd just say, say one thing. One is that measure, understand where you want to be. And, and I'm just parroting David to a certain extent. Understand where you want to be and what results you want to have and work back from there. If you don't have clarity around that purpose, which is why in our methodology, we talk about critical tasks. And in almost any job, whether it's a brain surgeon or whether it's, you know, it's someone working on an automotive production line, you'll find that there is a very small number of things that differentiate exemplary top performers from average performers, what they do differently. If you focus on that and you understand, that means that then you can help You've got the clarity in terms of what you need to help to do to help people to get to that point, and it might be a, it might be through training, it might be through some other some other approach, it might be through performance support, it could be through whatever. Uh, but you need to do that, and I think we need to get away from this these false assumptions that we have. And I mean, there's one which really gets to me, which is the idea, and and lots of organisations have bought into it. The idea, for example, that higher engagement leads to higher performance. And actually, you know, again, organizations have sold into HR departments around the world around high input. Now, obviously you want your employees to have high levels of engagement because there is a research-based link between engagement, employee health, staff turnover, things like that, absolutely. But there is no link between that higher enga more engaged employees are higher performers. In fact, there's a reverse link. And Michael Riquetta did a, a meta study of this some years ago, an academic study, to show that higher performing teams and people are more engaged, but more engaged people are not necessarily higher perform higher performing. And actually, it's a lot to think about it for a second. It's logical. If I'm doing really well, if my team is is doing really well, I'm Happier, I'm more likely to stay in my role, stay with the organisation. But actually, simply building engagement is not a, a, not a recipe for high performance. And yet, a lot of a lot of L and D people spend a lot of time working with their HR colleagues in terms of measuring engagement. And, and it's the same with uh, I think David, you made the point about measuring at the end of a course, or maybe Rob, you did. You know, getting getting that data in did it, was that course success? Was that course useful for me? Did it feel good? Yeah, of course. That's that tells you nothing. It might tell you about the experience, but it doesn't tell you anything about the about the mm. the output really. So I think that L and D really needs to get into thinking about sort of upper level around strategically thinking about what does my organisation or this business unit or this part of the organisation or this particular manager or leader who's asked for ask for me to do something or my team to do something, what do we want to do? And if they can't if they can't answer the question in terms of what it's going to look like when we're finished. And that was a question I always asked. I, I was, a manager would come to me and say, Charles, I'd like your team to 
develop this program on XYZ, upgrade our, our first level manager program or our onboarding program, I, I would always say, okay, what is it going to look like when it's finished? And if they can't answer or you can't elicit the answer to that, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I like that. I think we, yeah. we've gone, James, have you got something to add? I, I was going to jump in that, uh, you know, 100% agree with everything that's being said. And, it, you know, we, we ha my, my motto is always we have to begin with the end in mind. 100%, you know, anything that you, 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 you're creating or anything like that, it, it comes back to what are we trying to achieve and, and, and mm -hmm. really understanding the problem to begin with and, and, mm -hmm. and understanding where we want to get to. Um, and that, that comes through creating those environments where we can be honest and, and mm -hmm. candid with each other. Um, I'm just conscious what we have this other question, Rob. Um, but yep. it kind of ties in a little bit with what we're saying, what we've just been saying around sort of mandatory training frameworks, things like that. So some of this stuff that we 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 do within L and D that um, you know some of it is we have to do it from a regulatory point of view. So the the question comes from Kat, and I and I know Kat's sort of background. She's one of our members, but also you know for those of you who don't know, you know my background is is financial services, so highly regulated, compliant environments where a lot of the the training if you like um has to be done because there is a piece of legislation that says this person must have this training must sit on this course must do this um so cat was asking in an environment um where we have lots of checkbox trade checkbox training compliance training where regulators uh, only care about uh, you know did they do the training how can we reframe and reshape some of this um because you know, to, to the point that a lot of this is stuff that we, we have to do from a legislation point of view. What are your, what are your thoughts and, and, and where do we want to go first with that one? Um, I, I, I've got an opinion myself, but David's put his James Go on, David. His hands up. Go, go on, David. <laughs> yeah, so I used to work in finance as well. I worked for Lloyd's CSB when it was still a thing, uh, for Nat West and Lehman Brothers. Uh, Lehman Brothers could have learned a little bit from this, couldn't they? Uh, I, what, I, what I think is, um, uh, with, uh, with compliance is it's a necessary evil, okay? Um, I would say... Um, uh, if you are if if you're doing this from scratch and you're building something, uh, uh, putting in your your compliance or regulatory training, uh, I'd say um, you 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 need to do you need to make sure that you are solving the real problems first of all. If you are plugging a gap because there is uh, you you've got people who are, are non-compliant or you've been found out plug that gap you need to make sure you're solving actual problems now the vast majority of, uh, of organizations uh, are just trying to cover themselves just in case uh, something pops up and then learning and development can go to the LMS to see whether they've done the training whether they pass the scores and whether there's a legitimate case to, to get rid it's a it's a it's an uh, it's an episode in a uh, uh, devolving culpability for mess ups from the organization to the individual. Let's be really clear about it. Uh, I would say um, if you are uh, if you're doing this, uh, try not to outsource pain to the uh, to the employee. Do get them to do the minimum possible uh, in order to cover your backside. Uh, don't if you if all you need to do is uh, have them uh, read something. Uh, in order to, to be compliant, then that's the case. Just do that. If they need to answer three questions, then just write three questions. Don't write 10. A lot of it is actually box ticking. But what I would say to you as well is automate it. There's smart tech here where you write your messages in, you plug in your um, your your um, uh, your compliance training, and then it just goes off. Every time someone joins the organization, they get the uh, the content, then they're chased via whatever, um, whether it's email or whether it's by, by messaging, wherever it is, you can you, as long as you're not applying any admin to that, I think too many learning and development teams get caught up in the administration and the coordination of what they're trying to do and even the delivery of stuff that they'll never measure the impact of. So I'd say that automate as much as you can, outsource the stuff that isn't business critical, and then focus on the stuff where you can make a meaningful, demonstrable difference for, for your own personal professional integrity, as well as the benefit that you could deliver to the organization. Too many organizations feel that the that the um, our, our learning and development professionals uh, we'll see that their value is in the administration, coordination and delivery of bog standard L&D stuff. Uh, and I'd say that get yourself out of that. Uh, do do what's required to, to tick the box uh, or shore up your organization from uh, from uh, uh, any um, uh, fines or, or breaches in 
that uh, the uh, uh, regulation or the reason that, that compliance actually exists and get out and do the stuff that, uh, that that's really meaningful. But I would say don't get any silly um, uh, novel uh, training your people don't want it uh, they don't want saving from boring e-learning they probably want saving from e-learning but uh, but in the absence if you can't save them from e-learning make it as painless as you possibly can for them and don't waste their time that's fantastic advice david we're going satnam yeah i i think I, I agree with what david said about mandatory training and we've all been at the other end of it so let, let's not forget that but for me, learn from your great brands that you use at home. Learn from that because this is, you've got them at the very beginning. Don't forget this. This is your marketing opportunity. This is where you plug what you do as an LND person. This is where you plug all the great stuff. So when I was at the Ray Cross, this is the journey that we took. We started plugging our other stuff, you know, that you would want to learn. And we'd say, this is something you may want to come back to six months down the line. So, you know, don't miss that. Don't miss the opportunity that, yes, it's the stuff that they have to do, which in a way that you've already got the captive audience. Now highlight what you actually bring value to. But also think about the mandate trend that you're doing and, and as you know, I've, the sector I've worked in, in particular in the charity sector, things like safeguarding are paramount in that in, in the, all of those arenas, and, and so they should be. But think about how you then measure the long-term success of that is through case studies. And we tend to, we used to do that as a later on that you would do a case study to see if you really applied that. But don't lose the opportunity. It might not be what you want to be doing. You've got to do it. I agree with everything David said, but this is... Think of it as a great movie. I know Rob mentioned his movie Love earlier. Product placement, you know, think of all of those things that work for you. This is your opportunity to say there is a great coaching offer. These are the networks you can join. It really is to get your customer, which is who is the person that's joined, to engage with how great learning and development is in your organization. So don't miss that opportunity um, and, you know, there was many a jokes in my team about subliminal messaging. We never went that far, but I, I would love to say that we were that creative. But, you know, I think, think of the dry, but also that is an opportunity for sure. Can I just add, James, as well, I just think when it comes to mandatory stuff, and the organisations I've worked on have been tended to be heavily regulated by Ofcom. And I kind of look at the start with the end point again. And if the end point is we need everyone to remember how to be compliant, then an action of that tends to be we need to train everybody how to be compliant. But there's a couple of things in that. That, that one, that we did a, an e-learning once, if we want to call it that, that literally took them to the knowledge base where the information was, ticked when they'd gone there, and then they ticked that they'd read it. Now, that was that was an e-coms that wasn't an e-learning that was that was literally a piece of communication that they ticked and then there was a conversation that ensued after that around do we really need courses or do you just need a tick and i think the other part of that is that you know we don't if you look at something like security identifying and verifying customers for example which is I'm a big not a robot. <laughs> I, am not a robot. <laughs> I don't get i don't get trained on to how to do that security when i'm logging into a website I don't get sent on a course because the system won't let me in unless I am compliant. So if we can start influencing systems and processes that mean I can't not be compliant, we'll need to do less training on making sure people know how to be compliant, <laughs> if that kind of makes sense. So how can we start automating some of those things, to David's point, to, to actually mean that compliance is, is, is automated rather than at the subject of people's choices? Yeah, br brilliant stuff. And hopefully, Kat, you're listening somewhere uh, and that's been really, really useful and helps you uh, reframe some of that mandatory compliance training that you have to do uh, within within her organisation. Brilliant stuff. I'm conscious of time, James. So I think mm. what, I'd, what I'd love to what I'd love to kind of conclude uh, this kind of panel uh, section around this, this debate today, which I've really, really enjoyed, by the way, is just if we could have one tip from each of us of what that first step could be for people listening today to start moving away from order takers to wave makers. What's the one piece of advice, either something you've done or something you'd recommend or a client or an organization you've worked with has done. What's one thing, what's the first step that 
could be made on the journey to that. And, you know, if I was to start the ball rolling to give you a bit of time just to think about what your answer would be, it would be about how we start influencing those people above. Because I hear a lot of people, certainly a lot of L&D managers, that will talk about senior leaders, they don't like this, I don't get to talk to them, they won't listen to me. And whilst I'm not necessarily the, the biggest fan of talking of circles of influence, I always think to myself, okay, if I can't influence that person, who do I know that I can influence that influences that person? And there might be two or three lines of separation there before I get to the right person. But don't give up because you can't influence that person at the top straight away or that influence that decision maker straight away. If you want to start doing this, run an experiment with a stakeholder who does believe in what you're trying to achieve or we will listen to what you're trying to do run a comparison so in terms of what uh, what david was talking about the data there can you prove with an individual stakeholder that their stats their data that really matters to the organization actually improved based on an experiment compared to the old ways we were doing it and then they can go and influence the next person up to show that data rather than you saying yeah we had 200 people that came on that course and it was brilliant so that would be my sort of like first step. Who can you influence? What's that first follower you can engage and start experimenting with? Uh, James, if, if I come to you, what might be one for you? Yeah, so I guess my, my biggest tip or my biggest learning when I was in, in L&D was, was, was learning to actually have a bit of confidence about what I was doing and to push back and at first that was really really frightening and you know I'm one of these people who hates confrontation um, but I learned to do it in a in, in a way that was professional but be able to push back on some of these stakeholders that wanted me to just do that training James just get on with it uh, you know tick that box do that uh, to push back and say actually do you know what there is a better way and let me show you a better way to do this and let's have a conversation because if I do it the way you're asking me to do it we're not going to get the result you're asking me to achieve. Uh, and being able to push back and be honest with stakeholders and, and with senior people within the organization. Uh, so, be, so be confident, guys. You know, you, you are the L&D expert. You were, you were brought into that organization as, an, as a learning specialist and a learning expert. Um, so be confident enough to have those conversations with your stakeholders and push back uh, when you feel it's the right thing to do. Pick a victim, James. Pick a victim. Um, <laughs> you know, just purely because she's next to me on the screen, Joe. I'm going to head to you. <laughs> uh, I think it's going to be building on your point there, James, actually, which is not so much about the pushback, but actually learn to ask great questions. So there's a bit of me here saying coach your stakeholders as well. Learn to ask great questions because then you'll find out um, what the what the true solution may need to be and it may be absolutely very different from what they thought they were asking for so learn to ask great questions and listen love that one joe and i think you know going on to one of your podcast guests michael bungay stanier and one of his uh, seminal pieces around the coaching habit stay curious that little bit longer so ask your question then ask another one that you maybe weren't going to and then another one <laughs> yeah love that yeah. uh go on joe pick the next um uh, i'm gonna go david Thanks, Joe. Uh, so I'll, I'll go with a, uh, a stop and start, if that's all right. Stop talking about learning and start talking about the performance. Um, so um, uh, Amory Burbage uh, had this uh, brilliant line uh, when, I, when I spoke to her on uh, my podcast. Uh, and she said, take a training request as a cry for help. It's not a training request. They are asking <laughs> for your help. So if, you are, if, uh, if they're asking for your help, then you will ask them, um, what what it is that they're seeing that uh, that they would like to change? What the impact of that is? Who specifically is responsible for that work? How would they like it to run? What's the cost of doing nothing right now? You're building an advocacy. You're building trust with someone. You're having a conversation with what what meaningfully matters in the context of their operation. And with all of that information, you can start working with them and the people responsible for the work on actually addressing what matters by keeping it and collecting learning needs and building up in your mind what would be brilliant in that course will lead you to another 284 years of nothing changing. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, I, so I'd say that, uh, that uh, and you don't need permission for any of that. Uh, if you, because uh, sometimes uh, in a very small number of cases, 
your stakeholder will say, no, 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 David, you weren't listening. I asked for training, right? And then what you do is you go, oh, it doesn't matter then. So you apply as little money and attention as you possibly can on their training course. But if they really are interested in making a change, they'll be interested and you can work with them on actually making that change. And then going back to your point earlier, Rob, you can influence people by going, Look what we did by having a conversation about outcomes and performance rather than learning. And then more people will be interested in doing that rather than having a learning conversation. You won't change everything overnight, but you don't need permission. You don't need the stars to align. You don't need to change the culture. You need to change that first conversation and have the, the, the guts to continue having a different conversation because that's how you'll make a meaningful difference. Mm -hmm. Love that. Absolutely love that. And then there is, there's actually a, a TED talk, I forget whose it is now, but about the first follower and starting a movement. And quite often it's not the person that stood there shouting out about what we need to change, i.e. L&D. It's the first follower that actually starts working in that way with us. And then people start saying, I want a bit of that because that, that, that seems to be working for them. Uh, so I think that's absolutely brilliant. So David, you choose for us the next person, please. Great. Thanks, Rob. Uh, sat then, please. Thanks, David. Um, I think you've both uh, uh, covered lots of great topics there. I think for me, think of learning as food. You are your own target audience, like really genuinely, you know, we all eat, we all learn. So don't forget that. I There are so many learning products and I think I've been guilty of it at some point in my life. You know, building something that even you don't like. Like, come on, you know, it, you are the you are your own test product. You know, really think about what you would want in a learn in a, in a journey or a development program and all of those conversations. So don't go and do an e learning that even you don't like clicking through. Like, honestly, you are already a target audience. You have the people experience. You work in that organization. You are the primary goal. So. Don't put your your experience to one side. Treat you as the first test audience. So that's my advice. And um, I'll go hand over straight to Charles. <laughs> Love that. Go on, Charles. Thanks, Satnam. And, and really just adding to what Satnam and Joe and, and David have, said, have all said, uh, my advice would be always start with the end in mind. Ask more questions than you think to be reasonable. Uh, listen. And then when you've identified what the real problem is, when you start to build a solution, plan for the 100 and start with the 70. So that means, you know, think about everything that you could possibly do or what needs to get done in order to solve this problem. But always start with whatever it is is closest to the point of work because there's a huge amount of research that shows that when we learn something new or relearn something, if it's in the, if the context in which we're going to use it, is as close to the context and where we learn it, it's going to be more effective. And that bit of research goes back about 121 years uh, by a, a couple of uh, American psychologists uh, called Woodworth and, uh, and uh, Thorndike. So, yeah, so start with the, with the end in mind, ask lots of questions, and then when you build it, build, build systemically. I think combining the last two points there, so, so Charles and the Satnam, I think it's really important as L&D professionals, yes, think ourselves as learners as well, but tying that into 70, 20, 10, go back to that original research and, and do what they did. Reflect yourself and go, how have I learned the things that I have learned about learning about L and D about anything else in your life and go back and just I kind of segment them off a little bit. And like Charles, you've said it overlaps. It won't all be, nice and neat everything in the 70s some things will overlap but kind of go back and go what are the main things are may ways i've learned and the chances are with all the experience and expertise that you've gained all the learning all the all the things you've been through in your career and life the chances are the main learning points won't have been the e-learnings or the tick boxes or the training courses they may have been a starting point they may have been a great reflection point but, you know, if you're in doubt of that, go and ask your manager, go and ask a senior leader and said, right, OK, I think I could replace you and all your expertise within three weeks of training someone else up. And they'll tell you, of course, you couldn't do that because they know <laughs> they know that their expertise has been built up very differently than just a training course. So uh, absolutely brilliant. And thank you all so much for coming along today and answering all these questions. I, I mean, I've learned plenty from it, so I'm quite sure that everyone watching and on the recordings that we'll, we'll put out there as well have learned plenty as well. So, James, over over to you to kind of like uh, 
kind of your thoughts and debrief and thoughts about the day and any other questions that you want to ask um, ask the guys about their takeaways. Yeah, so um, what I wanted to do at the e- at the very end here really is, you know, if we have got people on live, uh, I'd like to give you a bit of space really to start to think about actually what are you taking away uh, from this event? So I've got a few questions to get sort of hopefully some juices going, get people thinking about what they want to do. Um, but equally, panel, if you want to jump in as well, you know, if you feel that listening to what other people have said, you've learned something new or there's a little nugget that you, you've you taken away, then by all means, jump in with those questions as well. Um, so uh, if you are live, uh, please feel free to interact as well. If you want to chat and send it through to us um, and, and uh, you know, you're happy for us to share that um, uh, live and interactive. But if not, uh, please make sure you do this. And if you're watching the video, feel free to pause the video at this stage and give yourself the chance to reflect because it is such an important thing to do. Um, ignore the, and ignore the man in the check shirt taking photograph selfies. Oh, here he is with his <laughs> selfies. <laughs> Selfie man, Rob. Um, so so my first question, as I say, I'll give it give some time of just uh, airspace just for people to reflect and think. And then I'll come to our panel and see if they've got anything for them. But my first question really is, what has been your key learning point today? So if you're listening to this, just pause for a moment and think about and jot down, um, give you 10 seconds or so. What has been your key learning point today? So, panel, has there been anything for you that you've kind of, as we've been discussing and, 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 and chatting away, uh, anyone had any kind of learning points or little nuggets that they're taking away from, from what some of the other guests have said? Where should I head first? So I'm looking to see if anyone's keen to, fab, there we go, Rob's put his hand up. Or was that a, put your hand up if you have got a key learning point? I've got one. I've got go one. On. Go on, Rob. I think well, I think the, the one of the key things that I've really hit home with me today is when David was talking about you know what a Disney if you'd have turned up this this would have been said about you couldn't do that and I think what really made me think was that you know the target is different for everybody individually as a team training teams learning teams talent teams. It, there's not just one way of going, this is what you need to do and how you need to do it because your goal might be different. Um, so I think, you know, let's, let's really work. And I think, you know, tying it into the work that, that Joe does with coaching culture, really focus on well, what is the goal before we start to solutionize? What is the goal? Really articulate that. What are we here to do? What difference are we here to make? How can we help the people do what they need to do? And what is our role in it? And from there, you can start to put these first steps into place. So thank you for that, David. It really got me thinking. Yeah, no, I, I, likewise, uh, um, I, I really agreed when, when, when David was saying that from a point of view of, you know, every organisation is different. But for us as L&D people, it's about understanding that. And again, it comes back to, talked about it a lot. I feel like I'm parroting stuff we've already said, but that, that questioning, listening, understanding, um, and, and uh, you know, really uh, beginning with the end of the end in mind. Okay, so my, my second question uh, for those listening, in, in fact, actually looking at the chat, we have got someone who responded. Uh, so Catherine said that uh, her, her point actually was always start with the end in mind. So there we go. Thank you, Catherine, for being live and interacting with us. Um, so my second question for you to ponder and reflect on, and I'll give you again, just 10 seconds to, to reflect on it. The second question um, is how will you use what you have learned. So how are you going to take away that point that you've learned? How are you going to use it? What, dif- what, what are you going to do with it? So again, I'm going to hang that in the air for 10 seconds and let people ponder that. Okay, so again, I'm going to head to the panel first and say, has anyone got any thoughts on how some of what we've learned can be used and, and, and how we can put some of this stuff into, into practice. Yep. Fab, where am I heading? <laughs> I think that was it. Jo- Joe made a tentative no, Joe, go on, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> it's really difficult not to put my hand up like this. Yeah. Um, back at school. Please, sir. Please, I know. Sir. Um, I, 
Well, as part of my role, we've got um, the Coaching Culture magazine and we are literally now at the finishing touches of our issue 14 of the magazine and we are doing a, an article um, on just-in-case versus just-in-time learning. And everything that we've talked about today is absolutely about how you bring that well, one, I'm going to question the word learning, to be fair, before the article goes to print. <laughs> uh, that's going to get me thinking. Um, but actually about how really um, to, to share the, the importance of that relevance to your role and how you can excel in your role is absolutely about that just-in-time uh, discovery and, and I think it's so important to get the message out more and more rather than just focusing on the just in case stuff which is back to the comment earlier which was move away from learning being something like schooling brilliant Joe uh, in just so that, that it's out there if people want to get get that uh, episode 14 or anything how can they go about doing that uh, it's back to earlier on the uh, go on, go on to our coachingculture.com and you can for free subscribe to the resources and issue 14 will be being printed off next week so it'll be do that quick to get hold of issue 14 uh, so it's joining our coaching culture community and it, but it's there's, issue 13. there's issue 13 a culture of belonging <laughs> which is exactly talking to what satnam said earlier um so yeah um just go subscribe join the community and you'll get all these free resources Brilliant. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, so my third question for those uh, listening in and, and wanting to interact, uh, but also to us as a panel, uh, is what support do you need? So again, I'm going to stick 10 seconds on the clock, give everyone the chance to reflect. Uh, but in order to put that into practice, to, to, to take what you've learned and, and use it, what support do you need? And again, hopefully, if you're watching the recording of this, you're pausing it and you're really scribbling down and getting your thoughts down of what support you need. Um, but I guess the, the question to the panel is, you know, where else can they can they get some support? So you, you've you all talked about some of the things you did and we found out about Charles's book on, on Amazon uh, and also your website, Charles, where they can get some downloads and access some things like that. Joe, obviously, they can go onto your website. Um, David, I know you've got the podcast. Do you want to just share a little bit about that? And then, Charles, I'll come to you. Uh, but, David, do you want to share where they can get access to that podcast for further support and, and uh, to learn more? Yeah, sure. So one of my key learnings was uh, that you know when Charles was talking about his time at Reuters, when Satnam was talking about a time at the Red Cross uh, and NHS Trust, my ears prick up because I I've worked in context in learning and development in both finance and uh, in media. Uh, bless you, Joe. Um, <laughs> and I've worked with people closely in other sectors as well. And I know that the that sectors are, are, are fundamentally different in terms of their cultures and their expectations. Uh, and so what better way to uh, uh, to understand context and cultures by listening to people and their stories. So by all means, please uh, uh, download and listen to uh, the Learning and Development podcast in which uh, I, as I've said, I'm 90 odd episodes in. Uh, and I try to speak to people who are on the front line uh, and doing learning and development that matters within, uh, within their organisations. And, uh, and I'm a big believer that you can't separate culture from uh, a development from culture. Uh, it's like uh, it's like trying to remove the egg from a cake. Uh, and so uh, so listen to, to people's stories and understand their cultures uh, and, of course, apply uh, apply contextual nuance to uh, to your development as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much, David. Uh, and Charles, I, know, I saw your hand pop up. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to make a, a comment about what you need. Uh, I, I mentioned Jerome Brunner, the educational psychologist, uh, early on. Uh, Brunner once posed the question, what's the difference between learning physics and being a physicist? And uh, you can replace physics and physicists for any other profession, any other uh, area of work you care to think about. And Brunner's answer to that is when you... When you learn physics, you get the certificate, you get the degree or whatever it is. It doesn't make you a physicist. What makes you a physicist is that, in Jerome Brunner's words, you're inculcated into the culture of the profession. So, in other words, uh, you need to build a community or join a community, multiple communities, and you need to, to work with peers and, you know, the work that, Joe, you do, I'm sure, that's your daily work in terms of making sure that you're... Uh, creating a culture of learning through others, learning from coaching and so on. So I, I think that, uh, you know, go back to Brummer 
uh, and think about uh, think about you know what what's the difference between learning about LMD and becoming a real LMD professional? And one of the answers is embed yourself in the professional community because that's that will be one of your greatest opportunities to learn. Love that, brilliant, yeah. Charles. And you've you've led me nicely into my fourth question, actually. But before I do that, I just want to quickly turn to Satnam. And is there anything from you in terms of support or or, or things like that? Um, don't stay in the ivory tower. You know, I, I think there's a real element of all of us as we progress in our in our careers and our journeys that um, we're not walking the walk. We're not doing. You know, whether we're, we're living that virtual, but get out there, listen. Um, you know, I, I've been at, in my new job just short of three weeks now, uh, and I'm taking every opportunity to go and hear and listen uh, and understand what, uh, where the greats are and where the where the areas of improvement are. And you know, I w- I w- went into a building. If you ever, ever know where I'm kind of based out of, there's lots of camps there. And I walked into a building the other day and. Um, wonderful receptionist who guided me through to where I wanted to go but while I was waiting for the lift I heard her have what I call the fundamental leadership conversation with a patient who turned up with a mobility issue she was empathetic she was compassionate and you know that is what you want the person to experience she was able to say you know you sit here I'll get the service to you because you have a mobility challenge and you know that wasn't the word she used but her at that touch point, she gave that person the best experience. So go out there and listen for those nuggets. And if you have time, question them how they develop their style, because it there is something that you will learn from that. So don't stay in the ivory tower. Listen to your people. Experience it. Experience those journeys that others are experiencing so that you can go, those bits don't need improving. They're fantastic. But here I think we can add value. So again, it's really about being those ears and eyes of the organisation. Fantastic. Thanks, Anna. I, mean, I think that's I, so important. It's so easy in, in L&D to become siloed or or sit in our little silo away from everyone else and think we're, we're, we're the ones down the corridor somewhere in an office far, far away where actually, you know, to do what we do and, and to have impact, we need to be in there and amongst the people, be visual and, and finding out what's happening. On, on that, on that, on that, James. I just think you know you, you're talking about that siloed thing. It's so mm. easy to think, how am I going to do this on my own? And even in big L and D teams, you might be the only design manager still. You might be the only training delivery manager. You might be the only training evaluation manager, and no one else really talks your language. Everyone on this call has got a community of sorts that they've built or they're part of. Mm. Join them experiment with things try things out listen to david's podcast listen to my podcast i know satnam you do work with the lpi look at the things that they're doing and the resources they've got in the community they're building the coaching culture community we've talked about the um the podcast the magazine the conference getting people like-minded to come and share those ideas with charles you've got the uh, performance-based learning programs and all the different forums that that, that go uh, coach with that and i've seen the the events that you put on linkedin as well that people can join to start thinking this way and of course, James, not to mention, obviously, the, um, uh, the, the L&D Mastermind community. Be brave, be vulnerable, go out there and just share things. And when people post things on there or ask for advice on there, go to them and give them some or has, ask them or coach them or just support each other with these things. We're not on our own. There's so many people going through the same thought that you're having right there and then, even if they're not in your organisation. Brilliant. And again, you segued me nicely into that final fourth fourth question that I'm going to ask and get our audience to reflect on, which is how can you use community to support you? So, you know, we've talked a lot about belonging. We've talked about this post-COVID world. I'm a massive believer in in community. So how can you use community to support you uh, as you continue this journey of changing from being an order taker to a wave maker? I'll give you 10 seconds to sort of think about that, reflect on that, um, and uh, and then we'll go to the panel. Fab. So, um, so you know, as, as, as you all know, the L&D Mastermind community, I would love that people come and join our community and, and, and you know, we can be a part of, of giving them a space to belong and also support them in this journey 
from becoming order, uh, becoming wave makers and leaving behind order to being an order taker. Um, but from our panel, any thoughts from you about how you can utilize community uh, in this? So uh, go on, Satnam. Um, I think the work I've done is all been about community and the organization of work, the fundamentally enriched in community. But I'm going to steal something which was from the Red Cross when I first joined, and it really resonated with me, which was that we are, you know, we're a global organization. So we're around the globe and around the corner. And that's what community is all about. That, you know, in this world that we're living in virtually, uh, and I'm sure we'll continue. We've got access to all of that. We've got access to that global community in a way that we've never had that access. Um, but also we can be around the corner to each other. And I think there is an element of what Rob was saying was that, you know, do reach out, do uh, connect with people. So that is your around the corner. You know, it's like talking to your friend and saying, I've got a question. Do you, I think you might be able to answer or signpost me to someone. And then, you know, go broader, go to that global community, listen to those areas that you are fascinated by. Also think of the words that translate. I think there's a, some of the stuff that we've talked about translates quite well into things like transformation. And there's so many people who do transformation. You know, I love things like, um, it, you wouldn't look at it now, but, you know, and, and at one point I was a gym freak. And I used to love things like the 12 transformation plan, you know, those things. But I used to like the science behind it, which said, you know, how do you retain it? And all of those things are areas that you can really tap into with the lens of what you want to do in your organization. So it, it really is, think of it like, almost like the Red Cross, as I said, around the globe and around the corner. So it's very much about the tools to access communities in a multitude of ways, as well as those individual conversations. Don't hold back, reach out. Brilliant, thank you so much, Satnam. Um, any other thoughts from around our panel around community and then we better start to wrap things up, hadn't we, Rob? That three hours has flown by. <laughs> I, I'm a, I'm actually thrilled about the fact and pleasantly surprised that we've nailed the timing exactly. And that just goes to show that <laughs> as an L and D professional, we quite often would look at that and go, "How the hell have I going to have enough content to last three hours?" <laughs> but it's not about content; it's about great conversations. So that, that's how. True, true. I think that I think that's almost a great way to end. But let me just, out of courtesy, go to our panel and say any final thoughts, anything that you want to jump in with before we we close things. No. Fantastic. OK, well, thank you so much uh, to all of our panellists for coming along today. I really, really appreciate it. There's Absolutely. been some fantastic insights and fantastic observations. Um, and to our audience, I really, really hope that you have found that valuable and you're taking away some key learnings that you can go away and implement uh, in your organisations and in your L&D career that help you go on and thrive. So uh, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's joined us interactively. I can see some comments coming in straight away. People, people from around the world saying thank you so much for the session. So um, thank you, guys. Uh, and I'm going to end it there at exactly three hours. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you to our audience as well. Thank you. Bye now. Well, that's it for this special episode of the Leadership Untitled podcast. I really hope you gleaned as much value and knowledge from that as I did as part of it. Please let me know if you'd like us to run more of these events and also what type of guests you would like to see on there to give you their advice. My thanks again to everyone who put questions forward for the panel and of course the panel itself. Until next time, have a great day.